Chapter 1 A welcome sun poured down upon the steaming prairie which seemed to be bursting now with the first green shoots of spring. The moist earth was springy beneath the hoofs of Eldridge Sample's saddle pony and his three pack animals laden with buffalo meat. The blue sky smiled as if pleased by the sweet scent of budding things awakening after the winter sleep. The plain seemed to give out an aura of peace, but Eldridge was not deceived. The ex lawman, his face thoughtful, was reacting to the psychic beat of warning drums, something he knew enough never to disregard. Just as the willow buds would burst into leaf, just as the earth was swelling to the thrust of pale green shoots, so the rolling prairie sea would spawn its annual threat of feathered death. Somewhere yonder, where the sky dipped down to kiss the earth, bronzed and restless warriors girded themselves for the trail, groomed their fastest ponies, strung their bows, feathered their lances and made ready their contraband guns. From lifelong experience with the men of war, Eldred Sample knew no fear for himself. The battlefields of the eastern U.S. robbed him of that with countless battles, and many long nights spent on his own behind enemy lines. Too long had he pitted his wits, his nerve, patience and resourcefulness against men who wanted him dead to be afraid. But there were others to be considered now. The western Pacific was pushing westward its twin bands of gleaming steel, at from two to five miles a day. Great crews of graders borrowed earth to rear the embankment. Gangs of tie setters, track layers, sledgemen and bolters sweated and delved as they inched across the plains. Ahead were the engineers, protected by soldiers. Long lines of freight wagons, drawn by straining mules, raised an endless dust as they hauled supplies forward. Switch engine crews bucked ties and steel to the railhead, with tooting whistles, hissing steam and a great clatter of drivers. Behind were the vast commissaries, the office forces. And all looked to Eldridge to supply the meat that was the lifeblood of the line. Eldridge topped a rise and felt the blood run faster in his veins. Yonder, an ugly ribbon of brown on a pale green carpet stretched the new grade. Dust hung above it in an irregular, crested cloud. Far back, the sun caught the white tilts of Rag City, that disreputable collection of dives catering to the starved senses of the laborers. Weird, ear-splitting ululations broke in on Eldridge's reflections with stunning suddenness. Swift thunder of hoofs. Crash of a gun, whine of lead and whir of a feathered shaft. Eldridge's horse reared up, whinnying its terror. The pack horses swung their heads and broke into a panicky run. For a long moment, Eldridge had trouble with his mount. Then, when he had the animal straightened out and spurred into a hard run, he jerked his sharp's buffalo gun from his saddle boot and swung in the saddle. What he saw added nothing to his peace of mind. At least two score Cheyenne braves, hideous in paint and feathers, fanned out behind him, their runty, spotted ponies bellied down in a hard gallop their few guns reaching out to bring him down, their upraised lances fluttering bravely. They were on the kill and it would be a close thing, if he made it at all. Throwing his weight in one stirrup, Eldridge twisted farther and brought the rifle to his shoulder. He caught the sights, threw them across the broad figure of a chief in full headdress and reluctantly pressed the prong. He numbered many friends among these plains tribes and he knew too well the outraged tempers of the red men at this violation of their age-old hunting grounds by the iron horse of the whites. Nevertheless, he was forced to bow to the first law of the frontier, kill or be killed. The sharps roared, recoiled heavily against his shoulder. The chief loosed a shrill scream, tossed his lance high and went back over the tail of his horse. Holding his mount to its utmost effort, Eldridge jacked out the empty and stuffed in another .50 caliber cartridge. Again the weapon spoke. Another war bonnet vanished. Another riderless horse roiled the pursuit. Damn, he hated killing Indians. He would rather save the bullets for outlaws. Bandits and bad men he knew roamed these lands. But he couldn't explain the distinction to the wild war party chasing after him, intent on claiming his pate for a spot on their belt. Over a rise and down, the racing Cheyenne were hidden for a few moments. Eldridge took stock of his packs. They were running strong yet despite their loads. Arrows jutted from the burdens of two, so far, none had been maimed. He glanced ahead, where the blue uniforms of the regular troops paced along the right of way. Then he glanced back where the Cheyenne were piling into view. They were not gaining, their lust tempered by the loss of two leaders. Eldridge knew he could outrun them easily on his long-legged horse if he were willing to abandon his meat. That he was determined not to do. He'd had to work hard for it, and the railroad crews needed meat. A bullet grazed Eldridge and he bent low in the saddle, urging on the three pack horses. An arrow thudded into his cantle, humming like a hornet, then snapping off with a splintering noise. The yells were louder in his ears now as the Indians gained. And the burden-bearing horses were showing the effects of the hard race. Eldridge straightened, shot again. It was a mile now to the tracks and, along the grade, 
The workers were pausing in their labors, staring. The soldiers were moving out to form a ragged line, their rifles giving back the glint of the sun. Three quarters of a mile. Eldridge could see the men scattering, dropping their tools and racing for the handy gun wagon. Teamsters whipped their mules across the embankment. So near and yet so far. Eldridge fired, loaded and fired again. He seldom missed, yet now the Indians were casting caution to the winds, knowing they must drop their quarry soon or not at all. The air was filled with the flight of steel-tipped arrows and bullets whined their song of death about Eldridge's ears. A dart pierced one of the pack ponies. It swerved violently and took out, limping, to one side. With a muttered oath, Eldridge reined aside after the injured brute. Yells of triumph lifted from the thundering horse behind. Eldridge sheathed his hot carbine, turned the animal back. Then he whirled back toward the tribesmen, his pistol flashing out and spitting venomously. The audacity of it scattered the Indians from the center and toward the wings, gave them momentary pause. Eldridge didn't crowd his luck. He had no chance against them in a fight and he knew it. So, having accomplished his purpose, he whirled again and was heading after his pack horses at a dead run. The maneuver had gained him a precious fifty yards. But now the Cheyenne were quartering in from his two flanks. And there was yet a third of a mile to go. A bullet struck his pony. The animal shuddered, tried gamely to keep on, failed and fell. Eldridge flung himself free, went to the ground and scrambled back behind the quivering carcass. Frantically, he stuffed cartridges in his new Colt's pistol, shook out six swift shots. Pony's pitch pulled to his left without materially checking the charge, and he was loading again for a try to the right when, suddenly, Indians and their horses were falling. Streams of lead were whispering overhead and, from the grade, the guns of the soldiers were speaking a rising thunder. The Red Riders rallied, reared their mounts. A shrill order flashed along the line. Then they turned and were in full flight, kicking their straining ponies frantically in the ribs. Eldridge rose, jammed his gun into its holster, took a last glance at the plane's death that had missed him so narrowly and turned toward the right of way, with the cheers of hundreds of men ringing in his ears. Weary, shaken up, caught in the backwash of an emotional letdown, he walked spiritlessly toward the trackway, where alert hands were halting the winded pack brutes. A wagon whirled past him the driver bawling that he would fetch in Eldridge's saddle and gear. Eldridge waved him on, walking soberly to the road bed. Hold it! A deep, commanding voice roused Eldridge from his preoccupation. He turned to see a stocky, straight-backed man leading a party from a three-seat Surrey, south of the embankment. He plowed up the slope from the borrow pit, grabbed Eldridge's hand and pumped it. I'm General Prescott, the chief engineer of the road. You had a close call. I've gone through a few tight spots in my time but... I don't mind telling you I'd have kept right on running from the Cheyenne and forgotten all about my pack horses. I reckon you'd have done just what I did," Eldridge said quietly. If you realize the part fresh meat plays in putting this road through. The plains are full of meat, but men don't grow on bushes. Meat is scarce, General. I'll be glad to take you out to prove it. The engineer seemed taken back. He scowled into Eldridge's blue eyes. Then he smiled. If you say so, sir, that's all the proof I need. It was a brave thing and we're proud of you. Your name, sir? Eldred Sample, said the hunter. General Prescott gripped his hand firmly, then turned to his companions who had just come puffing up. Gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present Eldred Sample, whom you just saw cheat a nasty death by an eye winker. Sample, Mr. Robert Barker. And Mr. Franklin Mason. These gentlemen are helping finance this great project, Sample. I'm mighty glad they could be here on the line, to see for themselves the hazards we face. Bowing slightly, Eldridge expressed his pleasure and touched the moist palm of the floored Barker and the stiff fingers of the nervous, still frightened Mason. General Prescott was quick to follow up with a moral. You have seen, gentlemen, what kind of courage it takes here at the end of steel. Can we, at home, who have in charge the raising of finance, be any less courageous? Robert Barker shook his head emphatically. What I've just seen has convinced me, General, that you have communicated your will to these men and that the road must surely go through. It will give me ammunition to convert my colleagues. He turned to Eldridge inquiringly. Sample, whatever inspired you to take after a cheap horse in the face of those savages? You might have been killed. A little matter of meat, Eldridge explained dryly. Without it, the men do not work as well and the more it costs to complete the work. My orders were to bring it in and I did. Spoken like a soldier, applauded the general. And there you have the spirit of the Western Pacific, gentlemen. Admirable, said Franklin Mason recovering his poise. May we have the pleasure of your company at our table this evening, Mr. Sample? I'd like to hear what goes on at the spear point of our attack upon the wilderness. 
Eldridge agreed and it was arranged. The two men tipped their hats and started back toward the Surrey. But General Prescott tarried, looking hard at Eldridge. Sample, he said cautiously, are you related sir, to Matt Sample, who used to boss our supply department? Used to boss it? Eldridge inquired. What do you mean by that? Any kin to you? Persisted the engineer. My father, sir. General Prescott's eyes went bleak. Then you haven't heard? Heard what? Eldridge felt the blood draining from his face. The general suddenly seemed anxious to avoid his eyes. Your father is dead, Sample, he said covering his emotion with the bluntness of a soldier. He was killed, shot to death in the respite palace almost a week ago. Murdered? Eldridge said hoarsely. That's a harsh word, Sample. Maybe so, maybe not. Certainly there are too many violent killings in Rag City and the wild towns we leave behind us as we move westward. Some are murders, others are perhaps justifiable self-defense. It will be so until there is law to restrain the young hot bloods. In your father's case, well, I don't know. From what I've been able to find out, Matt went into the respite palace, drank a little, gambled some and had words with a Texan, Santee Plummer, a gunman employed by Buck Brady. He paused, his face inquiring as he saw the chill in Eldridge Sample's eyes. Plummer, echoed the young man. Yeah, I know the one. The story goes, continued General Prescott, that Plummer caught Matt cheating at cards and that when he challenged him, your father went on the fight. I don't know. I'm too busy putting this road across a continent to have time to investigate personal quarrels that take place off the right of way. Matt was a good man and I'm sorry. We will be hard put to find anyone to take his place. Well, take it easy, boy, and don't be hasty. We'll see you at supper. Chapter 2 When Eldridge went to the company mess that evening, he was still a little dazed by the catastrophe. Bluff, hearty Matt Sample dead. The singing, swearing, swashbuckling man who had been father and mother to him lying stiff and cold in a rough pine box, back in Junction City. The man who had taught Eldridge everything he knew, who had never shunned a fight or lost one, murdered. It seemed fantastic, unbelievable. Walking into the vast, canvas-topped hall, crowded with the famished, sweating horde, Eldridge searched the officials' tables in vain. Prescott? Echoed one of the waiters. Oh, he and his guests had the private car hooked to the evening train east business of some kind. Eldridge nodded and went out. He was glad enough to be alone. It was a nasty night. A hard wind from the west had whipped in black, scudding clouds. A cold drizzle formed pools to give back the glints of dingy lights. Beyond, in the yards, an engine puffed restlessly. Lanterns flashed through the murk and men called to one another. A renewed ringing of the engine bell and an insistent whistling roused Eldridge from his uncertainty and seemed to make up his mind for him. All at once, he jerked down his dripping hat hitched the gun at his thigh and broke into a run. Along the muddy roadway he sped, bracing himself against the treachery of the greasy footing. By the time he reached the tie train the swaying cars had gathered momentum, seemed to be racing past him, their wheels clicking measured warnings. Smoke from the wood burner swirled about him as he sprinted alongside, peering for the hand rungs. Now Eldridge launched himself, caught the steel ladder holds. One hand slipped and, for a moment he swung there precariously. Then, Regaining a secure hold, he scrambled up and over the side of a boxed fuel car. He could have made his way forward to the comfort of the warm, roofed cab of the engine, but instead he crouched at the front of the car, pulled up his collar and hunched miserably, prey to grim thoughts. He had no stomach for company this night. Sometime around midnight, the rolling train slowed, drew to a stop in the roaring frontier metropolis of Junction City. Life, red-blooded and robust pulsed through the night as Eldridge climbed stiffly from the train and strode toward the bright lights uptown. The new lane walk swarmed with men making the rounds of the dives. Eldridge pushed through them, heading for the Respite Palace, headquarters of Buck Brady, King of Vice along the ever-westward railroad line. As he walked, Eldridge grew warm from the effort and from the heat of his thoughts. Brady and his satellites were the curse of this great project. Waiting like foul spiders to trap the roistering Irish laborers, poison them with cheap whiskey, befuddle slug, rob them, and then cast their dulled husks outside for the railroad to use as it could. Making their own laws and enforcing them in their own arbitrary ways. Eldridge thought of the big, brutal genius who commanded this golden, vampire business, Buck Brady. The man had started with the first rail laid out of Omaha, with one rickety wagon, a barrel of rot gut whiskey and a dozen tin cups. Since that historic day, his shadow had lain increasingly dark over the road. From the first, he had prospered, taking practically all of the earnings of the horde of workers, always expanding, discouraging competition with violence. 
Somehow Eldridge's terrible anger turned from the Texas killer who had murdered his father, to this suave, overfed man who was the mainspring of every evil act in Junction City. He's the one that's got to go, he told himself. He's ringed with guns and the man who braces him will die. But, with him out of the way, everybody and everything will be better off. The respite palace reeked with sweat, smoke and the sour smell of stale liquor. It was a bedlam of reveling, this home of the heartless baron who controlled the lives, habits and destinies of so many of the inhabitants of Junction City. This place and others like it, were the main factor in holding back the progress of the steel, reducing the efficiency of the men and storms, floods and Indian forays put together. Eldridge elbowed his way to the bar, took his station there with glass and bottle. The whiskey warmed his chilled blood and while he drank it his roving eyes picked out the wary, hawk-eyed gun toters who looked to Buck Brady for their bounty. He knew some of those plug uglies, and many of the crimes rumor connected them with. Yonder, at the door of the gambling wing, stood bulky, towering Sledge Brady, the bouncer. He had beaten more than one man to death with his sledge-like fists. At the entrance to the dance hall was Long Hank Varco, a gun flash with a long record of killings in dead wood. Through the broad archway, presiding over a busy game, was Jasper Ridley, a gambler who had killed several men across his board. Even as Eldridge looked at Ridley, the man lifted his head. His eyes, striking through the smoky interval, caught Eldridge's and clung, his brows arching in surprise. Then Eldridge, not wanting attention from anyone other than Plummer, shifted his glance. It was some minutes later when the bartender struck a bell with a bung starter, the full-tone peal bringing a hush over the crowded hall. Eldridge Sample. He bawled. Eldridge Sample wanted at railroad headquarters at once. Eldridge Sample, go to headquarters. He was startled. What could he be wanted for at this time of night? He thought then of General Prescott and decided that someone had seen him in Junction City and had told the chief engineer. Prescott had warned him to act sanely and slowly, and was now probably worried about what the son of Matt Sample might do. Reluctantly, and with a last sweeping look for the man he saw, Eldridge bestirred himself and left the saloon, more than a little surprised at the number of eyes that followed his going. It was still raining outside and the wind was cold. He followed the wooden awnings for what shelter they afforded, turning finally to angle across the street toward the drenched and darkened canvas of the company offices. He was swerving around a pool of rainwater when his name was spoken from the dingy shadows of a flapping tent side. Sample. This way. Suspicion stabbed through Eldridge. He halted abruptly, poised and deadly as he peered toward the hail. Then, almost without reason, he was reaching for his pistol. Too late. A slender ribbon of orange flame licked toward him, then seemingly through him. With the explosion beating along his nerves from his outraged eardrums, Eldridge felt strength pour from him like grain from a rent sack. His legs gave way and he fell. With the last of his consciousness, he heard the splashing of running boots. Then he knew no more. He came back to life with strong hands lifting him and a raucous brogue in his ears. Come, me bucko. It's a crying shame, by the almighty, the whiskey they're giving us for our money. Here, stand on your own feet. You can't sleep here in the mud. Are you all right? Eldridge couldn't speak, but he did manage a grunt which the friendly track layer took for affirmation. He slapped Eldridge between the shoulders, nearly knocking him down, and hurried away. Eldridge stood weaving there, pray to waves of pain through his middle. The call had been a trick, he knew that now. Jasper Ridley, the gambler, had spotted him, dipped off someone, probably Santee Plummer, and had told him outside to his death. And Eldridge had little doubt that death it would indeed be for him soon. Surging rage poured through him the best tonic he could have found. It seemed to release energy from remote reservoirs deep inside him. He surged erect and reeled toward the respite palace again. Brady and his killers were laughing up their sleeves that they had consolidated the murder of Wild Matt Sample, by the death of the only one interested in avenging him. Well, the time was short, but it wouldn't take long. A shot apiece for Brady and Plummer. After that, nothing mattered. Chapter 3 Staggering drunkenly, Eldridge fed his will to survive with the heady tonic of anger. The shock of his wound was passing, leaving pain that robbed him of breath. Pressing his fingers to his side, he drew them away red and sticky. He was bleeding, but he had to last till he got into the big saloon. At the corner of the respite palace, he quit the walk, moved down a narrow slot where the drip from two eaves drenched him, where the fierce draft tunneled through chillingly. Near the rear, he opened a door and entered the gambling hall, thinning of patronage now because of the lateness of the hour. Inside he paused, raking the room with a hot glance. Neither of the men he sought was in sight. Nor were there any of the hawk-faced gunmen, unless, Jasper Ridley could qualify as such. Gritting his teeth, holding himself with an awful stiffness, 
Eldridge started toward the archway leading to the noisy barroom, leaving little puddles with each step, so soaked and sodden were his buckskins. He sordidly rise and make the little movement with his hands that meant he was closing his game. He saw chips exchanged for gold. And then, with only a few steps separating them, Ridley had lifted his deep-set eyes to Eldridge. And it was as if the glance had robbed the young plainsman of his scant remaining store of strength. He caught at the back of a chair, braced his hand on the tabletop and sat down. The gambler shook his head. Sorry, Sample. Game's closed for the night. I have other business. The click of Eldridge's cocking pistol beneath the table cut him short. Sit down, Eldridge commanded, from between locked teeth. Shove out chips and cards and keep your hands on the table. And if I don't? I'll kill you, Ridley. Where's Plummer and Brady? And while I'm asking, where's Longhand Varco? The gambler, busy with markers and a deck, shrugged. How should I know? I'm not their guardian. They come and go, where, is none of my business. But don't worry, they'll show up. They always do, when they're least expected. I'll wait for them, Eldridge said. And when they show, see that you don't forget what you just said. What's that? That you ain't their guardian. My killing plans for tonight don't include you, Ridley. Kind of you, murmured the gambler. When you start shooting, my friend, I trust that you won't forget that I just work here. I play Buck Brady's game, with cards only. You can depend on that, by the word of a gentleman. The fog over Eldridge's eyes was brushing away and he saw a bleak and hopeless look touch the man's finely chiseled features. Thanks, he muttered. That raises you a little above the rest of these murderous coyotes in my eyes. From the barroom came a sudden uproar of yelling, whistling and stamping of boots. The watchers at the other tables turned to the archway and began clapping. The gambler's morose eyes lighted. The cynical twist left his thin lips and all sullenness was gone from his face. Now the crowd in the archway was parting as a girl walked through. A beautiful girl, very queenly in a shimmering silk gown, high-piled chestnut hair and a smile that was bomb to Eldridge's gnawing agony. Her eyes went to the gambler and as she came toward him, he flicked a nervous glance at Eldridge, then rose and swept off his hat. Courtesy brought Eldridge up too. He shifted the cocked pistol to his left hand, let it hang at his side as he, too, lifted his hat. Mary. There was a note almost of reverence in the gambler's voice. Allow me to present Mr. Eldridge Sample. Sample, this is Mary. Toll, the sweetest singer on the plains. The girl smiled into Eldridge's pain-filled eyes, curtsied, then looked at Ridley, laying her hand on his arm. I came to tell you, Jasper, she murmured, that I'm singing your favorite song tonight. Thank you for thinking that much of me, Mary. She laughed lightly, patted his cheek and was gone. With a deep sigh, Ridley sank into his chair again. And, because Eldridge's action was slower, the gambler's eyes widened on the red stain deepening on the plainsman's wet buckskin. Sample, he said. You're bleeding. Yes. Eldridge sat down. A slug in the guts is all, Ridley. A little token of the esteem in which I am held here. Meaning what? Ridley asked sharply. One of your fine feathered gunman friends told me outside and let me have it from the dark. Don't know which one, but, as long as I've a score to settle with Plummer, I'll hold him responsible. Plummer and the man he works for, Buck Brady. Ridley inclined his head. I'm sorry, Sample. I thought you were drunk. Such a wound is egregious. You better get over to the hospital and... Maybe I won't need a doctor when the evening is over, Ridley. I'll wait here for the two I named and let the devil decide the issue. Admiration edged the gambler's eyes. What a soldier you would have made, Sample. I was a lieutenant of Lawson's Rangers, Eldridge told him. Lawson. The gambler's eyes burned. And I rode with Morgan. I know. You ranked a captain. Remember the licking we gave you at Tyndale's Mill? I've tried to forget the whole, awful mess, Sample. Silence fell between them and, after a while, a low groan came from Eldridge's lips. Damn it. He groaned, fighting against that enveloping haze. Why don't they show up? Ridley started, poured a drink. Here, he said firmly. Get this into you. And give up this damn foolishness. If you wait too long, this bullet will kill you before they do. Hell, man, you've got a lifetime stretching ahead of you if you don't throw it away. You can wait to square your accounts. Eldridge took the drink in trembling fingers and lifted it. To the old days. Captain Ridley, he murmured, and drank. The gambler's face dipped down and he shook his head. Those days are dead, Lieutenant Sample. This is Junction City, under the shadow of Buck Brady. Through the sudden hush in the respite palace came the full, mellow tones of Mary Toll singing Annie Laurie. Jasper Ridley's head remained bent as he listened. Eldridge, 
trying to focus his vision toward that limpid voice, suddenly saw Buck Brady come breaking through the crowd, in the wake of the burly sledge Brady. From some hidden reserve, Eldridge drew the strength to rise. Bracing himself with his left hand, he raised his wobbling pistol. Brady, you double-crossing son! He called weakly. His weapon weighed a ton. He saw Sledge Brady halt, brush Brady back and reach for his pistol. Then blackness was blotting out the figure. He heard Jasper Ridley cry out. Sample, you drunken fool! Felt the gun struck from his failing hand. Then felt himself crashing to the floor. Voices seemed to rise and fall as they swirled about him, quarrelsome voices. Into his half-consciousness, came Brady's heavy voice. And please learn not to interfere in my business, Mr. Ridley. In the guts, eh, and he's lived over it. Well, it won't be for long. He's as good as dead right this minute. The gully out back is running water, boys. Take him out and toss him in. There's too many of his kind committing murders around here. Eldridge tried to cry out, but his spent faculties eluded him. He felt rough hands pick him up, knew he was being carried. The brief journey ended. Men counted, laughed and heaved. He had the sensation of falling, then shock ran through him and water was cold against his skin. He had a brief sensation of smothering and tried to struggle against it, but his beaten faculties failed to respond. There was a vast roaring in his ears, then all was blank. Chapter 4 Trapped in some dark, deep void of semi-oblivion, a thousand damning shapes swooped down to torment Eldridge Sample. He fought and fought, until exhaustion left him easy prey. Shrieking Indians pursued him endlessly. A thousand times he tried to reach Santee Plummer, only to see that muzzle flame streak from the wet darkness, only to feel the crushing, numbing impact of the bullet in his vitals. And always he could hear his father crying weakly for help. Always he could see Buck Brady lurking in the background, grinning, taunting. Then, strangely, the darkness of the pit was breaking. The light grew, dispelling all those tormenting shapes. For what seemed a neon, things spun dizzily before him, he felt himself whirled through space and then he was awake. He lay in bed, in a comfortable room fanned by a soft spring breeze. Jasper Ridley stood over him, looking down with eyes gaunt and harried. His face was grey and sweat beaded his brow. He gave a great sigh of relief as Eldridge's eyes opened. Awake, eh, Sample? Man, but you've had me worried. He turned abruptly away, reeled to a window and filled his lungs with one draft of air after another. For some moments he remained there, staring out into the town. Then he turned to a table littered with bandage, unguents and medicines, picked up a bottle of whiskey and downed a long drink. He shuddered a little as he lowered the flask, then poured liquor into a glass and brought it to Eldridge's bedside. Swallow this, he ordered, holding the glass to Eldridge's lips. You must have been mighty close to hell in the last four days. Maybe you'll like to wash the taste out of your mouth. Four days? gasped Eldridge, when he had stopped gagging on the whiskey. And four nights, said the gambler wearily. And not a wink of sleep have I had. I've sat in a game that long, but this. He weaved dizzily, caught himself. Then his chin tipped down and his eyes closed. His legs buckled and he was snoring softly as he measured his length on the floor. Four days, Eldridge murmured. Four nights. We ew. His mind went back to the affair at the respite palace. Ridley must have pulled him from the creek, taken him to his own quarters called a doctor and stood guard as nurse, all in defiance of Buck Brady, if the boss of Junction City ever learned of it. Too weak to think deeply, Eldridge lay back and took stock of himself. He was out of pain and the itching of his wound hinted at satisfactory healing. From the beat of his pulse, he deduced that his fever had burned itself out. He dozed, woke again to find the gambler sleeping where he had dropped. The afternoon breeze was turning cool and Eldridge managed to loosen a blanket and drop it over the man's form. After that, spent by the slight effort, he was content to lie there listening to the roar of Junction City. Engines puffed and shrieked. There was a constant tolling, where casements Irish workmen loaded or unloaded steel. Wagon wheels rumbled interminably as empty wagons came in and heavy loads moved out. Here was everything that Eldridge knew and none of it moved him until the breeze bore him the sudden pop of a Teamster's bullwhip. It cut through Eldridge's nerves like a knife stroke, drew him to one elbow with a wrench of his breath and a sharp, stabbing pain in his wound. It drew a strange, clammy sweat to the surface and set up a nervous chill. He sank back on the pillow, amazed at his reaction to so simple a sound. He was trying to analyze his terror when the spiteful echoes of a pistol shot struck into the turmoil of the supply base. It turned him cold all over, drew a fearful cry from his lips. Then he was sobbing, his head buried beneath the covers, frightened as he had never before been. And all on account of a distant gunshot. For a long time Eldridge struggled for control, 
shuddering, chilling, sobbing convulsively. After a while he quieted, turned his thought to this strange thing that had happened to him. He was sick and weak, but what he felt went beyond that. He was afraid, horribly afraid of guns and the leaden missiles they threw. He, Eldridge Sample, crack hunter for the advance crews of the Western Pacific, was suddenly gun-shy. That was the deep scar left by the slug of the assassin that had ambushed him in the rainy darkness. And, somehow, Eldridge knew that scar would remain to devil him, even after his wasted strength came back, even after he found his feet and left this haven for the rigors of the greatest construction job the nation had ever known. He fell into a heavy, disturbed sleep. Yellow flickering lamplight filled the room when Eldridge awoke again. And he knew, almost without looking, that Ridley was gone. He was alone. And the thought was terrifying. Here he was, weak and helpless, unguarded, and gunmen stalked Junction City who would slip in and shoot him if they learned. It threw him into another sweat. Perhaps Jasper Ridley would get drunk and talk. Some one of Buck Brady's killers would come sneaking in and... He listened. Footfalls were approaching the door. Eldridge cried out in terror and buried his head. He was ashamed of his fear, but shame was no medicine for this unbelievable ailment, and he knew it. But it was Ridley who threw back the covers and took hold of him. Eldridge struggled. Stop it, you fool! warned Ridley. It's me. You've been dreaming. Look, Mary, he's covered with sweat and white as a ghost. We've brought you some strong soup. Come, straighten up and try to take it. Eldridge relaxed weakly, noticing the girl for the first time. She was smiling at him, and Eldridge realized as he tore his glance away, that this new sickness had left him unable to meet the eyes of his fellow men. It was horrible. He lay back, eyes closed, and allowed the girl to feed him. And while he ate, Ridley talked. Looked for a while, sample, as if you wouldn't live. And, frankly, I envied you. Jasper, scolded Mary. He shrugged. Why would a man want to fight back from the peace of eternal sleep for another go at this unbeatable game? It was none of my doing, murmured Eldridge. Thanks to you and to God, I'm alive and getting well, it seems. Thanking me and God, eh, said the gambler morosely. Thank God if you will, my friend, but not me. You should, perhaps, damn me. I acted to drag you from the water and stand by you in my time of weakness. Forgive me, if you can. Eldridge stared at him. I, I don't understand you, Ridley. That's because we're as different as night from day, Sample. You have courage, zest for living. I crave the peace that death brings, yet I am too cowardly to end this mockery. Hush, Jasper. Mary laid a hand on his arm. Don't talk like that. Eldridge marveled, never having seen a woman look at a man as she looked at Ridley. Nor had he ever seen such bitterness, such despondency, as was mirrored in the gambler's face. There was something between these two, he told himself, something that must go unspoken, something enormous and terrible and Eldridge felt a sudden moving kinship to this morose man who had saved his life. Just as a murderer's bullet had maimed Eldridge's body and stripped him of his most precious characteristic, so had something scalded the soul of Jasper Ridley. With the girl's grip on his arm and her eyes boring steadily into his, Ridley shrugged off his black mood, grinned and lit his pipe. By the way, Sample, he said, in a changed voice. I am supposed to have been ill for a few days. Buck Brady and all the rest think you're dead. Mary and I are all who know different of all the respite palace crowd. It will be better, perhaps, if you give them no reason to think otherwise. Meaning what? I mean get it out of your head that you can buck that crowd. Others have tried it, and failed. You will, too. When you get up on your feet, hop a train and go someplace in the east. You mean, run from them? They fed you one bullet this time. That you've digested it will prove to them that you're tough. They'll feed you plenty next time, for good measure. Eldridge felt the blood drain away from his face. A chill shuddered through his body. So keen was his suffering that he could feel those bullets smashing through his flesh and bone, even as the gambler spoke. No. He choked. No, no. Ridley misunderstood. I can understand how you feel, Sample, about that business of running. If Lawson and any of his men ever gave an inch, I never heard of it. It was their code to die first. And you're carrying that code along with you. But why? There you had a cause. Here you have Will. Nothing more than a full idea of crying vengeance for one who is happy out of it. Don't be a fool, Sample. It won't make you a coward to walk out of this mess. The whole lousy business is as rotten as Brady, and he's the only one who can win. You're tiring him, Jasper, warned the girl. We'd better go. You're right, Mary, said the gambler, picking up the tray. You just do some thinking about what I've said. You can do as you choose, of course. But seven days from today, 
At this hour, you're leaving this room. The following morning, Buck Brady will know that you are alive, if I'm still alive myself, Eldridge gasped. You'll tell him that? Why? Because I worked for him, Sample. Because I'm not like you, a brave man. I'm a coward. I lick his boots to keep my slimy place. Now good night to you. See you about dawn. Those seven days sped swiftly. Ridley and Mary saw that Eldridge wanted for nothing. The doctor called on him once each day, reporting favorably after each visit. He gained strength steadily and before the week was up, he was trying his legs. Jasper Ridley, in off moments, seemed to like to sit and talk with Eldridge. And the young plainsman learned of the movements in the great game being played from Junction City westward. Fresh crews were pouring in endlessly, from the east. Speed was the catchword. Indians were giving trouble, especially in stopping freight outfits hauling supplies to the advance camps. Trainloads of supplies were being derailed and destroyed by vandals in numbers of places. There was a shortage of foodstuffs and prices were skyrocketing. Wild Matt Sample was missed terribly. General Prescott and Joe Hunt, his general superintendent, were beside themselves, beset by endless problems. Though Jasper Ridley didn't say so, Eldridge sensed the fine hand of Buck Brady in these troubles. The man's shadow lay darkly over the destinies of the struggling Western Pacific. From talks with his father, Eldridge had learned long ago of Brady's boasts that before the rails had spanned half the width of the plains, he would own the contracts to supply the line with food, ties and hardware. That General Prescott had fought and balked him in this ambition must have been gall and wormwood to Brady. He had established his own stores, warehouses and freighting crews. And what little business had he already done with the harried road, when deliveries began to be delayed? Brady was scamping the road, holding back progress, and with good reason. Every day of delay added its quota to his growing fortunes. Eldred shrugged. It was hell, but it was the business of someone who was paid to defeat Brady. He, Eldridge, had made one pass at the man and all it had earned him was a bullet in the guts and a taste of death. He would get away from it all. His pony and gear, he had learned, was waiting for him at the head of rails. Far to the west lay the Rocky Mountains and a good living following the trap lines. Eldridge was shaky on his legs, the night he said goodbye to Mary Toll and walked with Jasper Ridley to the yards, where a work train waited to make the run to the end of the line. For a moment they stood silently, staring at the flashing lanterns, at the hustle and bustle of feverish activity. The engine let loose a warning blast and the gambler's hand went out. Eldridge gripped it. Goodbye, Ridley, and thanks for everything. Somehow, I'll make it up to you. Goodbye, Sample. I'm glad I could be of help. His eyes turned away from Eldridge's, widening with surprise and something more gripping. What will you do now, Sample? Go back to your hunting? Following the man's strange glance, Eldridge's breath was expelled by a violent reflex. Yonder, moving alongside the cars with the gunman. Plumber, at his flank, came Brady. And Eldridge was suddenly stricken with that old uncontrollable terror. Trembling all over, as if from an attack of malaria, he withdrew his hand from the gambler's clasp. And no, he stammered. I'm quitting the road. Losing myself in the mountains with my traps. Well, goodbye. The gambler's face was a mask, but in his eyes Eldridge read a vast disappointment, a trace of scorn. Ridley knew now. Knew he was afraid, yellow. Luck to you, Sample, Ridley said. He turned his back and headed toward town. And Eldridge ran to the passenger coach attached to the rear of the work train. Inside, he flung himself into a seat and huddled there drenched with the sweat of terror lest Brady had spotted him and was sending Plummer to finish an uncompleted job. Chapter 5 Back at the head of steel, Eldridge Sample was welcomed by men sincerely glad to see him. But their welcome brought little comfort and no answering smile to his lips. Everywhere were the signs of violence. Casement's Irish track crews went to work with guns in their hands. The cohorts of Buck Brady still held forth in Rag City, playing their treacherous games, daring the world to interfere. Eldridge's old boss wanted him to take up his hunting, but Eldridge begged off, pleading the incapacity of his wound which still bothered him. He stayed close to the bunkhouse, somehow sensing their change toward him. These hardy men took courage as a matter of course, and measured a man by the sand in his craw. Nights Eldridge struggled with bad dreams, with Brady's killers stalking him, with gun flashes lancing from the dark and lead crashing through his vitals. Once he woke up screaming, with sleep drug trackmen holding him in his bunk and trying to wake him. Days he sat in shady spots, staring out along the trackway toward the distant mountains. Those heights, which he had always considered as a haven, seemed strangely changed now, repelling. And, miserably, Eldridge confessed to himself, that he was afraid of the Indians. 
once he had laughed as he fought them. But now. Yet even as he feared, Eldridge also chafed. Idleness irked him. And he could see the gradual slowing of the work. Food, rails, ties, men, all were failing to get to the front in satisfying quantities. Lines of communication were breaking down behind and wild tales filtered to the front camps of burned wagons, vanished teamsters, derailed trains and ravaged stores. A vague restlessness obsessed the brawny workers. The rumor persisted that Western Pacific was going broke, that the work was to be halted, abandoned. Crews demanded their pay at the end of each day's work and the nights saw them riding the empties back to Rag City to squander the money burning holes in their pockets. For the twelfth time, Danny Mulvaney, the grading boss, came to Eldridge. He was drawn, worried, frowning. By the saints, he said, bluntly. When are you starting your hunting? You look fit as a fiddle to me, as far as your body's concerned. But something's eating at your innards, like a disease. What is it? I'm all right, growled Eldridge. Then get out there and fetch me in some meat. Two more of the hunters quit today and the rest ain't bringing in enough. Come on, now, or are you afraid? I take that unkindly, Danny, protested Eldridge, without anger. You saw me bring in the meat right under the lances of the Cheyennes. Sure and I did, kid. And that's what worries me. The Eldridge sample I saw that day is not the lad I'm talking to. Not but would that bucko stand by and see me brave boys drawing in their belts fair lack of meat. No, sir. What do you say, Eldridge? Eldridge kept his face down, shaking his head miserably and fighting against the chill that froze his vitals. Danny Mulvaney spat, turned on his heel and strode away. Eldridge stared after his friend, stricken with shame and anger. He was tempted for one brief moment to take after Mulvaney, spin him around and make him eat his insinuations. But he didn't move. It was hard, terribly hard, to prove the truth a lie. Yet, after minutes of thought, Eldridge knew he must take steps to beat this thing that held him in bonds. The longer he delayed the fight, the less sure he was of winning. Goading himself, he went to the bunkhouse and got out his guns. He trembled as he lifted the pistol. How awkward it seemed, how deadly. And the heavy sharps was worse. The muzzle described a circle as he threw it to his shoulder. Trying to catch the sights, he felt sweat break coldly over his body. He closed his eyes and groaned. Eldridge fought the long fight in that deserted bunkhouse, the good fight. And although he seemed to make small inroads upon his fear, he was able to whip his mind to the hardest judgment he had ever been forced to make. Death to him, and to his father before him, had been only the price of failure. Those two things were tied together like man and wife, and Eldridge hated them. Yet neither failure nor the death it brought, was as bad as cowardice and the scorn of one's fellow men. Failure was the same everywhere. Death here at Railhead was as absolute as death in the lonely mountains. The difference was the audience, the men he knew looking at him fail. His mind made up that the battleground for him was in the Rockies, Eldridge took his guns and gear down to the corral and gave his pony a feed of grain. After supper, when the shades of night had been drawn, when the hostile redskins would be haunting their lodges rather than the war trails, he would pull out. Alone, in some high mountain meadow, he would battle his gun shyness and try to reclaim a little of the Eldridge sample he had once been. The coming of night frightened him. He took no part in the rough and ready hilarity of the evening meal and ate little. Afterward, acting unconcerned, he moved toward the corrals. He had taken but a few steps when a group of horsemen, some of them straight-riding cavalrymen, came posting by. Dust rose under the beat of hoofs. Eldridge shrank back, his nerve suddenly stung by a vital, familiar voice. Eldridge sample. By the Lord Harry, but this is luck. A horse reared and a stocky figure swinging from a saddle, came toward him. The riders rained down, and then General Prescott came through the gloom to wring Eldridge's hand. Mighty glad to see you again, Sample. And doubly glad to have caught you before you got away on another hunt. You're done with that, my boy. I need you at headquarters. Headquarters? Eldridge gasped it, feeling the blood drain from his face. You, you mean Junction City? Junction City. You'll take over your father's job. I've tried several men but none came anywhere near filling Wild Matt's shoes. We're lagging farther and farther behind all on account of the lack of a strong hand behind the supplies. It's trouble, boy, and a jog for a sample. Take the first train back and tell Joe Hunt that he's to show you the ropes. Keep food and materials moving up and this line will win for Midland Pacific. Otherwise we'll fail and... He shrugged, shook Eldridge's hand again. Good luck, Eldridge. He turned back toward his horse. Eldridge, paralyzed with the thought of being again thrown across the path of Buck Brady, watched him go. Then, suddenly, he was leaping after him. General, wait. 
His voice was shrill and his fingers sank desperately into the chief engineer's sleeve. I cannot handle the job, sir. I'm a hunter and I know little else. Surely there is someone who can. General Prescott laughed, slapped him on the back. I understand your feelings, Eldridge. But, like a soldier, you'll stiffen under fire. All you'll need is a knowledge of what is required and how to accomplish it. I'll bet on sample drive for the rest. Yes, this is a duty assignment for a soldier, and I know what a fighter you are. Brady devils us continually. We can't get at the man and... That's it. Broke in Eldridge. That's what I mean. Brady and Plummer, they killed my dad. We'll cross and, and there'll be a killing. General Prescott snapped his fingers. If they point the finger at you, I know what the outcome will be. And it might be the best way out for us, at that, if they have the sense to let you alone, I think I know you well enough to believe you'll put any idea of personal revenge behind the need of the Western Pacific. Now listen, here's a few leads for you to think over. Brady has been working with the Missouri Valley farmers and they're now refusing to deal with us direct. Pressure. You'll have to overcome that, somehow. Brady buys their stuff, skyrockets the price and we have to pay. It's breaking us. He's charging the tie cutters for protection against the Indians, and we pay the charge. Then there's the renegades posing as Indians and cutting our supply lines. It's all got to stop, and you are the man to tackle it. Eldridge was trembling, murmuring over and over. I don't know. I don't know. General Prescott stared at him. And after a while he spoke reprovingly. Think of your father, Eldridge. He would have wanted you to step into his place. What father doesn't want that for his son? It was his greatest ambition to see this job finished. Damn it, man, millions of people have their eyes on us. The scoffers are beginning to take hope again, the stockholders beginning to lose it. Now get on back to Junction City and throw yourself into it. He rose to the saddle, gave a crisp word and led the way to the corrals. Dust settled slowly about the shaken young plainsman. Get back and throw yourself into it. The echoes of those words came back to him, stiffening him with their command. General Prescott was a military officer, looking upon his army of workers as soldiers. And suddenly Eldred saw this whole hectic business in a different light, as the advance of an army against the hostile forces of the wilderness. Indians would give way to farmers, buffalo to horned cattle, once the road was established. In his mind's eye, he saw dark furrows turning the earth through the buffalo grass, wave on wave of green crops swaying in the breeze, pleasant farm homes lining the railroad, peaceful towns. He knew that was the dream that drove General Prescott, Joe Hunt and the other courageous men who recognized no hazard tending to halt or retard the overland rails. Eldridge's eyes turned westward and somehow, his urge to ride into the mountains had weakened. Behind him, he knew, he would leave the scorn of brave men and the memory of his own father, the laughing, fighting giant who had never feared man or devil, who would have gladly died rather than abandon a trust. Almost without his knowledge, Eldridge was moving. He went to the corral fence for his gear carried it to an empty car of the work train, even then steaming up for the run back to headquarters. He was sprawled in that car, his head on his saddle, staring westward to where the rising moon touched the faraway crests of the Rockies, when the train pulled out. He shivered a little as the thought came to him that he was probably looking at those wild heights for the last time. And was pleased that there was no recurrence of the panic, only a heavy resignation to a fate that seemed inescapable. Chapter 6 It was an ordeal, Eldridge's return to Junction City and he both blessed and damned the windy darkness as he made his way to the living quarters of dominant Joe Hunt, the general superintendent. The blackness made him inconspicuous among the many men moving hither and thither among the canvas buildings. But he had to acknowledge to himself his fear of deep spots of gloom that shut out the moonlight. It was from one such place that the shot had come, the shot that had snapped something inside him, that had made him something far less than a man. Depositing his gear outside the lighted front of Joe Hunt's headquarters, Eldridge went in waited his turn and was finally shown into the private office of the calm, substantial man who carried so much upon his shoulders and whose personality seemed to fill the room like a tangible force. Glad to see you, Sample, Hunt boomed, crushing Eldridge's hand in a vice-like grip. Knew your father well and I've missed him more than I can tell you. General Prescott has mentioned you often, during our recent setbacks, as the one to take over your father's work. Eldridge eyed him gloomily. That's quite an order for a, a hunter, ain't it, Mr. Hunt? Joe Hunt smiled. The answer lies in you, young man. The job is yours and we're betting on the fact that you're a sample, son of Wild Matt. I'll sleep better tonight, I can assure you. Now about your duties. You know what you're up against? Eldridge cursed the heavy discomfort inside him. I understand the trouble well enough, he said spiritlessly. It's Brady. Brady, 
Hunt nodded solemnly. And all his hellish crew. They've pretty well euchred us, at this writing. It'll be your job to outguess Brady, outsmart him and outfight him if it comes down to that. Keep food and materials flowing to the front, and get them as cheaply as you can. Money is tightening up. Prices are rising. We've got to make a dollar go twice as far as before. The construction end is well organized for efficiency, but laborers won't do a day's work on an empty belly. You mustn't make your father's mistake of thinking all men fight in the open. That cost Wild Matt his life. Your enemies, our enemies, will strike from the dark. They, why what's wrong, Sample? You sick? Eldridge clutched at the edge of the desk, knowing that the blood had drained from his face. There was a stabbing reminder of a bullet scar inside him and his stomach was threatening to turn over. It, it's nothing, he stammered. Just an old wound that gives me trouble. I'll be all right, I hope. I hope so, too, Sample, Hunt said sympathetically. I mustn't keep you standing here, feeling like you do. This is my home and office, 24 hours a day. You can see me anytime, just by sending in your name. Your office will be in the big warehouse, down the tracks. Comfortable living quarters behind. Turn in now and start fresh tomorrow. And make things hum, for we're way behind. His hand came out. Eldred gripped it and turned outside, glad to get away. He was sick and shaken, and the thought that Hunt might learn the reason for his sickness made him sicker yet. Gulping great lungfuls of air, he plodded down the littered, humming yards, where lanterns flashed and men loaded supplies on waiting cars. Eldridge paused to watch the work, sensing a definite inertia that had not been there once. The workers, for the most part, were young, army-hardened and trained in discipline. The pick of the many, many thousands who had been tried. But now there was a dogged sullenness about them. Fewer recruits were coming up, each day more were quitting, going back east. Off to Eldridge's left. A bunch of men answered the roaring brogue of an Irish bucko and dropped their burdens. There was a quick gathering about a protesting foreman. Voices uplifted angrily. Eldridge suddenly forgot the thing that knotted his insides, walked over. Picking up a lantern, he climbed to a pile of ties. All right, men. He bawled. Close your jaws and listen to me. Startled, the men fell silent, staring. Then they seemed to shift into a half circle about him, Danned brawny-fisted men possessed of tempers as uncertain as open powder. A voice from the rear sang out. What's on your mind, me bucko? Speak your piece. While you're loafing here, Eldridge's voice flayed them. Chewing the fat and shirking your job, men are going hungry out there on the line. Gangs are standing on their tools, waiting for ties and steel. You talk and the railroad stands still. Well, it's going to stop. And who says it is? Shouted one, over the sudden mutter of discontent. And who the hell are you, me fine feathered tragedy, to tell us what to do? I'm your new boss. Answered Eldridge. Son of Wild Matt Sample. Know him, did you? I've got my orders from Hunt and General Prescott, and I'm carrying them out if I have to fire every man in Junction City. You can start with me, came the brogue he had heard before. What's the use of running good steel and ties to the front to lay in the rain? The railroad ain't going much further, a man can see it with half an eye. Eldridge peered trying to pick out the speaker. Failing that, he spoke to them with acid contempt. And I thought you were Irishman, the pick of Casement Brothers Cruz. It seems I was wrong. No Irishman would give up without a fight. The devil only knows what you are, but it must be something pretty low. A roar of rage lifted as his barbed words sank home. Their heads turned to this man who had suggested defeat, and curses stained the night air. And now the first Irishman was busting through them, his great legs churning. A hatless, red-haired giant, he planted himself before Eldridge. His mauling, freckled fists were, jabbed belligerently into his sides. His great shaft of a neck was strained and his red face was contorted. Not Irish, eh? He roared. Well, maybe you'd be pleased to tell Sean McGarvey what he is, then. Why I can smash you between me thumb and finger like as if he was a bug. It's wild Matt's whelp, Sean, warned someone. I can see it in him now. A splinter off the old stump. And Irish as Paddy's pig. Be the saints, we've a boss at last that's a fighting man from the old sod. No more of these pencil-pushing dandies. Sean grinned at the interruption and his blue eyes flashed. So it's Eldridge Sample you'd be after being, eh? Sure now, and that puts a different face on it. The saints be praised. But you're young and like a little child. The W. P's buckling in the middle, staggering and going down. Them that sticks with it will go down with her. Nobody but a crazy fool would go on with such a dead pig in the poke. It'll mean starving and slaving and then whistling for our pay. None of us are such fools. 
What do you want us to tackle for you first? A great roar went up from the rest and all at once they were pommeling one another. Eldred repressed his first real smile in weeks. He had heard his father speak of the feats of strength performed by the giant, Sean McGarvey. The man was strong as a bull, but fickle as the wind. Mere thoughts to him were signals to action. He needed a strong hand to steady him, to direct his mighty powers. When the demonstration quieted, Eldridge said. Sean, you'll be my yard boss here. And I'll be depending on you to keep the boys working. Now get that train loaded and no knocking around about it. When she pulls out, come over to the warehouse to see me. The big Irishman's roar almost blew him off his perch. By hell, sample, and you ain't making no mistake. He turned on the men. What ails you, you grinning jackasses? Didn't you hear the lad? McGinnis. Murphy. O'Sullivan. Jump at it. Fly at it, or I'll knock your empty heads together. Eldridge climbed down and walked away, listening to Sean bullying, praising, cursing and belittling, lashing his men to redoubled effort with his caustic brogue. All sullenness, all listlessness had vanished and Eldridge was warmed inside. It was good to know suddenly that he hail allies to lean upon, fighters like McGarvey and the rest to stand with him against Buck Brady. But uneasiness walked with him toward the warehouse. It was his name that had won them. To them, it meant the return of Wild Matt, whom they had loved. What if they should learn he was not made of the same stuff as Matt? Eldred shivered. If he could only live up to the name his dad had left. He was reaching out for a little of his old confidence when he climbed to the platform of the big warehouse and moved toward the lighted doorway of the office. Wondering what sort of man would be holding down the office night shift, he stepped into the untidy little room. And halted abruptly, his breath an audible catch in his throat. Sitting in the swivel chair, his shiny boots cocked jauntily upon the littered desk, was Long Hank Varco, Santee Plumber's running mate in the execution of Buck Brady's lawless orders. Varco's head swiveled about. His eyes widened and a nod whisper came from his suddenly white lips. For a moment he sat there, staring at the man in the doorway. Then he was bouncing to his feet. Eldridge was trembling, fighting against a weakness that left him helpless. But, as the man came up, he did force his right hand to the butt of the pistol at his hip. Varco, recovering his wanted callousness, filled his lungs and gave a mocking laugh. Well, well, if it ain't Eldridge Sample. Regular cat, ain't you? Nine lives and everything. What fetches you here? Eldridge licked his lips, his gaze fixed on Varco's gun hand. A job, he answered. I've got a job to do here. The cruel smile faded from the gaunt face. Starting it now, Sample? Starting it now, Varco. The gunman's eyes were hooded. I get it, feller. You wasn't satisfied to get out of here, through the devil's own kind of luck. You've gotta come back for... For a finish fight with Brady, Varco, Eldridge broke in. You can tell him I'm here to stay. Varco laughed. I'll say you are. Permanent. You'll be here when this town's forgotten. We'll see, said Eldridge. What you doing in my office, Varco? Your office? The man lifted bushy black brows. Mine. I'm the new superintendent of supplies and I'm too busy to be bothered with your kind. Get out and stay out. The gunman's grin was bleak. So oh oh. Not starting the old payoff yet, eh, Sample? Well, any time you feel lucky. His lank body shook with silent, taunting laughter. Eldridge Sample, superintendent of supplies. Won't that amuse Buck? Prescott must sure be hard up to name a man to the supply depot that won't last no longer than you will. Eldridge got a tighter grip on his screaming nerves. His face was dotted with beads of sweat, though it was cool in the office. I'll last long enough to bust Brady and give you something to remember me by, Varco. T. He gunman was tense, his lips furled back. You won't last the night, he promised, swaying on his toes and angling his elbows. Fact is, you're finished right now. Brady marked you for a cold grave, feller, and that's what you get. His right hand was flashing in the draw. And, Try as he might, Eldridge couldn't force his own hand to match the lethal move. He read murder in those eyes, but terror held him in its iron grip. Not terror of dying, for in that moment death seemed swift release from the damning thing that held him. But some unnamed terror, born of the bullet that seemed to have robbed him of his powers, his courage, his fight. He saw the gun flash from its leather sheath beneath the man's long coat, braced himself for the shock of lead. Then, suddenly, he was shouldered violently aside into the floor. Across his vision the bulky form of Sean McGarvey seemed to float with incredible swiftness and the giant's roar filled the small room. With one swipe of his hairy paw, Sean struck the lifting gun from the killer's hand. He caught Varco's two lapels in his steel fingers, drew the man toward him and struck, 
all in one vast explosion of muscular effort. Crash of flesh against flesh. Varko's head snapped back sickeningly. His hat flew off and he sank limply into the big man's arms. Holding the unconscious Varko in one arm, retrieving the hat with his free hand, Shaw jammed the top piece on the gunman's head, picked him up like a baby and carried him outside, without a look at Eldridge. From outside came a grunt, then the clump of a man's body on the soft earth of the roadbed. A moment later, Sean came in, dusting off his hands, smoke belching from his small inverted pipe. Eldridge had come to his feet, weak and ashamed. But the straw boss seemed to notice nothing untoward in his behavior. The lousy varmint, he rumbled, grinning savagely. The nerve of the likes of him, coming in here and drawing a pistol on me boss. Devil a bit did he expect you to talk up to him, me lad, after the chinless bosses they've had here since your old man died. Nice work, bucko. It's the way we'll build this road if it can be built. But watch that devil. He's one of Brady's worst. I'll watch him, Eldridge said. Now you get back to the job, Sean. I've got to get some sleep, being up so short a time from a sick bed. He watched the big Irishman leave, then went back to his sleeping quarters and to bed. The news of this happening, of his own return from the dead, would spread like wildfire through the ranks of Brady's henchmen. There would be furnished an added incentive for them to point their brutal talents toward him. As he fell asleep, Eldridge feared the coming of the morrow. Chapter 7 After a troubled, feverish sleep, Eldridge awoke with the noises of a waking camp in his ears. He was sitting on the edge of his bunk, pulling on his boots, when the door crashed open and a man surged into the half-gloom of the dawn-lit room. Eldridge came up, snatching his gun from its holster as he rose. He expected the worst and was surprised to make out a scowling, diminutive man with black, tousled hair peeping wildly from under his battered hat. His face was like wrinkled leather, his pale eyes snapping as he stood braced on short, bandy legs. Sure and I'm looking for Eldridge Sample, he announced belligerently. I'm Sample. The man eyed him up and down and Eldridge fancied he saw disappointment mirrored on the knife blade face. The scowl deepened. McGarvey was after telling me about you, he volunteered. I'm Patty McGinnis, who bossed the day crew for your father. Wild Matt, still the lily-fingered dandy who took this over turned me out. I'm back for my old job. Eldridge sighed his relief, studying the man. And he had the impression of looking upon a giant trapped in a small frame, a great spirit straining at its bonds. Regretfully, he shook his head. Sorry, Patty, but there's a good man in charge of the day shift. I'll be glad to have you with me, and if the day boss don't handle things like I want them. Sure, and he won't. He'll be no good to you on the road. He's no damn good to himself. What's that? Eldridge blinked. Come again, Patty. He's had a bad accident, grinned the little would-be boss. He's broke up most awful bad and suffering terrible. So? Eldridge was not surprised. There were 25,000 men on the line, most of whom worked with heavy materials, under the most hazardous conditions. Well, in that case, you take over your old job, Patty. And I'm glad to have you back. Thanking you most kindly, sir. Patty doffed his ragged hat, bowing courteously. What happened to the day boss? Asked Eldridge. You were there when it happened? He got run over, murmured the little Irishman. Sure and I was there, all right. Train run over him? Asked Eldridge, shocked. No, not so bad as that. I'm the man that run over the lippy son of a bitch. And I'm the one who put you short a boss. You, you beat that man so bad he can't work? That I did. I had a fight to handle and I handled it with a pick handle. When I finished him, I threw him on a car and started him east. He's somewhere between here and the Missouri River now, bucko, and I'm thinking he won't be back. Well, I must be after getting out to start the boys to work. See you later. Eldridge stared after him, marveling. The day boss he knew as a big, hulking brute who got good results by driving methods. Half pint Paddy had ruined him. The day crew would be in as good hands as the night gangs. Somehow comforted, Eldridge washed and went to breakfast in the mess tent. Later, sitting at his desk, he was confronted by orders orders, orders. In the midst of his bewilderment, Paddy McGinnis came stalking in again. Aldridge handed him pleas from construction bosses for ties, for steel, fish plates and spikes. And there were peremptory demands from camp superintendents, mostly trained army men, who predicted disaster if food was not immediately forthcoming. Paddy scrutinized the communications, wrinkling his snub nose. Sure and it'll take 25 trains to fill these, he remarked. We've got five to send out today. Take care of the food orders first, ordered Eldridge. The little Irishman tossed the papers back onto the desk. And where will I be after getting the food? 
There ain't enough in all the warehouses to fill half these orders. Buy it, Patty. There's 500 or more farmers and traders' wagons at the edge of town and hundreds more doing today. Have them in here to see me. It's no no good. The sons of bitches won't deal with the road. They won't? Why not? They're afraid. Brady has offered them protection if they deal with him first. If they refuse, their stuff is dumped and trampled underfoot. Your only chance is to buy from that devil, at his price. Eldridge grimaced. He didn't need to be told what that price would be, to him. It would mean quick bankruptcy for the road. To interfere, would be to invite a quicker showdown with Brady and his killers. But the showdown would come, anyhow. Patty, he said. You ship out whatever you've got. I'll get those wagon men in here and try to make a deal with them. Even if it means offering counter protection by locking horns with Brady now. If it comes to a fight, I'll be looking to you and Sean to stand behind me. Patty slapped him on the back. In a pig's eye, me, boy. We'll be in front of you. Not a one of the boys but wants to take an axe to Brady and his devils. He bounced to the door, turned there to fling back, any of us would have gone to hell for your father. And we'll go to hell for you. Then was gone. But his promise to the son of Wild Matt, comforting as it was, could not overcome Eldridge's reaction to the thing that faced him. He sat there for some time, struggling to control the spasms of shuddering that racked his body, the weakness that ran through him in waves. And, as he fought against the torment, he tried to reason the thing out. There was nothing to fear, he told himself, nothing worse than death. He was not afraid to die, he knew that. He had faced death in many sudden forms, since he was a ten-year-old boy, without fearing it. No, it was something else. The assassin's bullet had broken something inside him, something he must repair. General Prescott and Joe Hunt were looking to him for leadership, and leaders cannot be cowardly and expect to inspire loyalty and courage in their men. There could be no rest for him, no surcease. He must get hold of himself, face the facts squarely and tight his way out of this hole. He turned back to the reports, complaints, demands, lifting his head only when a shadow gloomed the door. Buck Brady stood framed in the portal, a brute of a man, powerfully muscled, thick-chested, beefy-faced, yet a pattern of elegance in his spotless fedora, black broadcloth and shiny Russian boots. A large, unlighted cigar was screwed into one corner of his mouth and a scornful smile lay on his lips. But his eyes were hard and savage as he stepped inside with a tread as light as a cat's and sat down in a chair. Not once had his glance, direct as a bullet, left Eldridge's face. And the younger man had the sense of being red, down to the last of the terrifying qualms inside him. Brady seemed to fill the entire room and Eldridge groped for a defense against the terror of him. It didn't help any when he saw the unmoving shadow across the threshold that meant one or more of Brady's bodyguards lurked outside the door. The boss of Junction City cleared his throat. Been sick, eh, sample? Lead poisoning, somebody said. Bad stuff, lead poison. Anger struck through Eldridge's fear. Bad for one is for another, he retorted. Brady laughed. I get you, sample. And mostly you're right. But some men are immune. I'm like that. He bit off the end of his weed, spat it onto the floor. His voice grew snappish. You were a fool to come back here, my friend. How much warning do you need? I don't think you would have been here except for the help of some man. I think I know who that man is, and I shall settle with him in my own good time. But enough of that. You're here and in a position to do business. Play the game my way and you've got nothing to worry about. You need supplies, I've got them. Can we get together? Eldridge's lips curled. At the thieving prices you've been asking, Brady? The man shook his head. No. I've learned my lesson in the matter of prices. I've thrown my price schedule away. I'm happy to announce a new list, effective since you took over supplies. Everything has doubled. Filled with a rage that seemed to beat impotently against this rock-hard figure, Eldridge forced his panic back into the remote corners of his being. It sure smells bad in here, Brady, since you entered. You won't mind my opening the window to air it out, after you leave. Then, mustering all his courage, he dropped his head over the stack of papers before him. He didn't look at Brady again. He heard the man's low, animal snarl and the creak of the floor under his weight. From the door came Brady's voice, deadly with menace. You underestimate me, Sample. I never make the same mistake twice. It's the secret of my success. He was gone then and Eldridge reached a sweaty palm to touch his throbbing, feverish brow. His heart was pumping like a trip hammer and he was almost physically sick. Out in the yards a locomotive whistled. Drivers spun and a heavy train started westward. Patty McGinnis came barging in. There she goes. Carrying the last of the food except flour. Did you do business with Brady? 
I did not, snapped Eldridge. And I won't. Good. The little Irishman rubbed his palms raspingly. And if he don't like it, I'll climb his frame. Now what about food for the boys at the front? I'll tend to it, promised Eldridge, without enthusiasm. You keep the construction stuff rolling up. Paddy nodded solemnly and went out. Eldridge rose and walked out into the heart, bright sunlight, filling his lungs in a vain attempt to lighten his misery. The yards were a bedlam. A crew hammered away at an engine. Gangs of men like ants swarmed along the tracks, loading cars with steel and ties. Out yonder, where the busy town turned back the grasslands, smoke rose from tier on tier of covered wagons wheeled by the score from the Missouri Valley, as far east to St. Louis and as far north as the wild Dakotas. And beyond, stretching as far as the eye could reach, plumes of dust rose skyward to dim the early sun, wagons on the march, filled with supplies denied the road because of Brady's greed. Twenty-five thousand of them on the way, Joe Hunt had said. An army of farmers and traders, afraid to dare the rage of the boss of Junction City. Railroad rates for shipping foodstuffs were high, and necessarily so, with all facilities choked with the flow of hardwood, tools and steel. Some trains of food had come forward, but more had been raided, the precious cargo destroyed. A small minority of renegades were storing up the lifeblood of W. P., daring a vast a guy of workers to do anything about it. With the scars of one bloody war still unhealed, no one wanted more of war's terrors. But war it must be, Eldridge saw that clearly now. A swift striding, military figure came toward him now, through the melee of the yards. Joe Hunt. There was concern in his eyes as he looked. Eldridge up and down. How goes it, Sample? Tough, Mr. Hunt. Food stuff is running short. But I'll get more, I've got to get more. I'm going out to the wagons. Hunt shook his head. I'm afraid Brady's got a stranglehold of fear on the wagon men, Eldridge. You may only waste time. Of course, if you get in a pinch, feel free to pay Brady stiff prices. But I've got several trainloads on the way, guarded by soldiers. If they get through. Brady's doubled his price, Eldridge said bitterly. A little compliment to me. Hunt whistled. That's bad. Then as he noticed Eldridge's pallor. You look sick, Eldridge. I wouldn't neglect that wound, if I was you. Why don't you go over and see the company doctor? He pointed. That big tent yonder. I'll be all right, Mr. Hunt. Stubborn, eh? Then I make it an order, Eldridge. Get over there for a checkup, right now. We can't afford to let you get down. Then in a softer tone. I like the way you've taken hold, my boy. The way the crews are working reminds me of the days when your father was still with us. If we can just hang on, we'll come out of this. Now go do as I say. An hour later, bared to the waist, his scar showing starkly against the whiteness of his skin. Eldridge heard the doctor's solemn judgment. The trouble is shock, Sample, he was told. The bullet passed between your heart and the ganglia of nerves behind your stomach. Both are diseased with shock. I have seen it in many boys, in the war. Full of courage and fight before a battle, scared sick and trembling when they left, the hospital. You, too, are afraid, of what you cannot tell. But don't get to thinking you are a coward. What you need is rest, quiet and peace. Avoid excitement and you'll be well in about a year. And where will I find those things? Demanded Eldridge. My job offers no peace or rest. And excitement is its middle name. Quit it. I can't, said Eldridge. They're depending on me. The doctor shrugged. A man is a long time dead, Sample. Your only chance is to follow my directions. If you insist on playing with fire, I can't guarantee your heart. He was writing a label for a bottle of yellow medicine. Take this, per directions. But, more important, get on a train bound for the east. Outside again, in the Russian roar of full-blooded Junction City, Eldridge walked slowly back to his office. Rest. Peace. Quiet. He laughed scornfully. Those things alone would kill him. Excitement. It seemed to fill the air along the line. He recalled General Prescott's words. Get back to Junction City and throw yourself into the fight. And Joe Hunts. It'll be your job to outguess Brady outsmart him and outfight him, if it comes to that. They were depending on him. He couldn't let them down, heart or no heart. Chapter 8 Strengthened rather than otherwise, more fatalistic than before, Eldridge made a list of his needs, set up a scale of prices that seemed a fair average of what the road had been paying and set out for the wagon encampments. First of all, he accosted a young farmer who lolled dejectedly against the wheel of his wagon. What have you to sell? Eldridge demanded. The fellow stared at him sullenly. Fifteen hundred pounds of cured meat. Ham and bacon. 
Looks like I'll have to give it away after killing stock and daring engines to fetch it here. A nice how to do. Other wagon men were moving over to listen. What have you been offered? Eldridge asked. The farmer mentioned Brady and named a price so low as to be ridiculous. A few of the others chimed in, cursing their foolishness and joining a rush that rivaled the gold stampede, twenty years before. To the young farmer, Eldridge said. Drive over to the railroad warehouse and unload. I'll double the offer. And facing the rapidly growing crowd, the offer holds for the rest of you. Who, who are you? Demanded one. I'm the superintendent of supply. Eldred Sample. They seem to shrink from him. Not much, said one man. I ain't selling to the railroad. Why not? I've had my warnings and I ain't sticking out my neck to the axe. Buck Purdy, he come from Iowa with me, he refused to take anything off of them Brady men. And look what happened to him. They jumped him one evening, burned his wagon and smeared his meat with coal tar. We, we buried him next morning. What you going to do? Demanded Eldridge, knowing their fear because he knew his own. Here's your stuff. Brady's warehouses are filled and standing still because we won't pay his thieving price. You going to carry it back home? I'll dump mine first, the young farmer declared bitterly. The railroad's no good. If they want our stuff, why don't they stand behind us? Why don't they clean out the nest of crooks that take orders from this Brady? That's just what it's come to, Eldridge said moodily. The road has had plenty to worry about that you boys wouldn't understand. Raising money, fighting Indians up ahead, dealing with dust storms, floods and labor troubles. Meeting troubles as their O's. Now the trouble is food, and they'll meet that, too. I give you my promise that if Brady interferes with your attempts to dispose of your stuff at a fair price, I'll deal with him, with all the power of a great company. Lay your goods on my loading platforms and if Brady molests you, we'll finish him. What do you say? For some time they wait his promise, looking from one to another as if to gather courage, shuffling their feet in their rough farmer boots. After a while the young farmer flashed a hard grin, drove his big fist into his open palm with a resounding smack. By the Lord, Sample, he cried. I'll throw in with you. This is a free country and we've the right to sell out where we can, and at the best figure. But if you let me down, I'll spend the rest of my days warning farmers of what they can expect out here. If I let you down, Eldridge said fiercely, it'll be because I'm dead. He whirled on the rest of them. How about the rest of you? You want to haul your stuff back to the farms? Come on in, Abe, the young farmer begged one of his friends. A gamble is all we've got left now. The road's offering a fair price and my folks need the money. Come on, boys. Let's get our feet wet. His plea turned the tide of their indecision. With no particular enthusiasm and with muttered agreement to try it this once, they scattered to inspect their animals. Word ran like wildfire through the lines of wagons. A scene of hopeless apathy suddenly became a beehive of activity. Well pleased, and hardly daring to believe it would happen, Eldridge hurried back to the yards, smiling grimly as he saw a man running toward the respite palace to report this latest railroad move to Brady. For hours, lines of wagons moved slowly past the loading platforms. Eldridge got word to Joe Hunt, who came over with his paymasters to give the farmers and traders crisp, clean currency for their produce. Patty McGinnis, seemingly everywhere at once, bawled orders that speeded the loading of the badly needed supplies. Wares, checkers inspectors, laborers, all toiled feverishly until the sun went down, until the chill of evening crept over Junction City and the bell rang the supper hour. Through it all, Eldridge stood where he could watch the hectic activity. Pray to mixed emotions, satisfaction that food would once again be rolling westward, fear of the new responsibility he had undertaken, grim determination to see the thing all the way through. That he would pay for this afternoon's work with his life he accepted, as the farmers had accepted his price. That, somehow, didn't seem to matter. It was annoying uncertainty that dragged on him, a failure to visualize just how Brady would strike at him. Such was the nightmare that brought back the flash of a gun through the rainy night the crushing impact of a bullet and strength pouring out of him like sugar from a torn sack. Eldridge went to supper with the rest, but the icy ball in his stomach would not let him eat. Night had fallen when he left the mess hall and went outside to smoke. He was nervous as a rabbit, restless as the prairie wind that moaned about the eaves. The wagons were still unloading, though the line had shortened and the end of a hard day was nearing its end. Eldridge could hear Sean McGarvey bawling at his men, speeding the loading of the waiting cars but his mind was on whatever was happening inside the respite palace. The place gave no outward sign of anything out of the way, but death was being plotted under that big top, and Eldridge knew it. Troubled, he went back to his office. Hardly had he seated himself when the low mutter of men's talk, the growing echoes of determined boot steps stiffened him. 
The platform trembled to the heavy tread of men who suddenly appeared at the door. Eldridge stood up, white-faced, his hand on his gun. But these were farmers, scowling, homespun clad and filled with a volcanic rage. Sun brown, bitter men who bore in their midst the limp form of one who had been beaten to death, or close to it. Glaring at him, they laid their pathetic burden on Eldridge's desk. There you are, Sample. Snarled one. All that's left of poor Pete Sackett. Here's the thing you promised wouldn't happen, that the power of the W. P would prevent. Here's the boy you won over with your smooth talk, the boy that begged us to trust you. What you doing about it? Who did it? Asked Eldridge, and it was an effort to keep his voice from trembling. How the hell do we know? Demanded a tow-headed giant. If we knew, we'd take care of it ourselves. Personal, I've a mind to take it out of your hide. I wouldn't try that, came a rich brogue, and Paddy McGinnis shouldered through the crush with a handful of Irish laborers. Now what's happening in here? Paddy, Eldridge said sorrowfully, this is the boy responsible for getting the farmers to sell to us. I promised him faithfully that if Brady made trouble, I'd settle with him. I'm going over to the palace. I want you and the boys to come along to watch my back. By God, and that I will. Sweeney, go out and tell the gang to grab their pick handles and stand by. But Paddy looked worried. You can't clean up on the whole devil outfit. What are you going to do? Nobody saw this happen? Asked Eldridge, ignoring a question he couldn't answer. I've been here it, said a towering Swede. I've been sitting by my wagon when I hear them hit him. I rush over, find Pete like this and his horses rip open with a knife. I see only one man going away, a big, strapping feller, bigger than me. Know him if you saw him again? Eldridge demanded. Yeah. I think so. You come with me to point him out. The rest of you wagon men go back to your camps. No use of you taking any more punishment. Come on, Patty. The rest of you take Pete over to the doctor. He walked outside, his blood hammering at his throat. But the weakness was gone and from some remote corner of his being he drew a force that, for the moment at least, allayed the terror. By the light of guttering lanterns, Eldridge saw the sea of Irish faces staring up at him, their eyes bright. A new bunch, said Patty. Just come in from General Casement's recruiting office in Omaha. They're hungry for raw meat, and itching for a fight. Don't be too sure you'll get it, Eldridge told them. I only want you there to protect my back. Come on, Olson. With the glowering Swede at his side and more than a score of fighting Irishmen at his back, Eldridge strode across the yards and crossed the street to the entrance to the respite palace. Men paused on the walks to stare, and the word flashed out that there was trouble. And throughout that brief march, it seemed to Eldridge that he was disembodied, hovering above himself and seeing the movements, the gestures of every man in that mob. It was dreamlike and unreal. But the hunting terror was squeezed down into some guarded corner of his insides, struggling vainly against the rage that drove him. His heart thundered in his breast and he prayed silently that the pump would not fail him until he had done his work. Eldridge was the first to smash through the door of the respite palace. It was the first time he had been inside the place since that night he had reeled in with Santee Plumber's bullet gnawing at his vitals. The saloon was jammed with roistering men, who fell silent to stare at the invaders streaming through the door. Men whirled from the long bar. Gamblers rose from their seats, their cards forgotten. Buck Brady stood at the bar end, flanked by Plumber and the towering bouncer, Sledge Brady. At their various stations among the games were Long Hank Varco, his face cut and bruised from Sean McGarvey's big fists and Brady's other gunmen and bodyguards. The place reeked with sudden hostility, but Eldridge Sample gritted his teeth and plowed through, Sean and Patty siding him belligerently, the fighting Irish yard men coursing behind with savage grins. A few yards away, Eldridge paused to face the boss of Junction City. Brady swung a pudgy hand toward the bar. Hello, Sample. Welcome to the palace. Line your men up to the bar. The drinks are on the house. Eldridge shook his head. We're particular who we drink with, Brady. We drink with our friends, and you're no friend of ours, or of any decent man. Brady flushed and the hawk-faced plumber stepped quickly to one side. There was an instant fanning out of Eldridge's Irish fighters, a low rumble in many throats and a doubling of fists. Eldridge felt cold all over, and he still had that sense of being detached. But every nerve was in its place and he could still command his faculties. He hung a swift glance at the big Swede. All right, Olson, he said. See if you can point out the one you saw leaving Pete Sackett's wagon. The man didn't hesitate a moment. Yeah, sure, he said fiercely. I've been looking at him now. That fellow. He pointed at Sledge Brady, the biggest of all the men who took orders from Brady. The bouncer, who had handled some of the toughest fighters among the shifting army of casements brawny laborers, 
Little O'Rourke erupt from his chest. He's a lying son of a dog. What is this? Step out, Brady. Order Deldridge, and there was a huskiness to his voice. We go to the mat, you and me. No holds barred. I'm paying you off for beating that farmer. What, with all those men behind you? Taunted Brady. I'll never let that happen, Sample. You're crazy if you think. My men have orders not to lay a hand on him, Eldridge broke in. Unless you or any of your spawn try to interfere. Come out, Brady. Fair enough, Sledge, said Brady, grinning. You can bust him with one hand. We'll drop the man that tries to keep him from being killed. Go on. The bouncer laughed, stripped off his coat. Good, he bellowed. Peel your bark. I'll mop this floor with you. A ring was formed, Eldridge's Irishman making a circle by gripping each the pick handle of the man to his right. Eldridge removed his coat and gun, handed them to Paddy McGuinness. And then, moving slowly toward the shuffling giant, he let his eyes run around the mass spectators. And thus, sitting at a table across the room, he saw the one man in all that great hall who was apparently uninterested in the fight that was about to begin, Captain Jasper Ridley. Chapter 9 The big man's rush brought Eldridge back to reality. He swung his head, bracing himself. Superimposed before the giant's terrifying figure, were filmy picture hash of this man in action, of men's brave stands against him, of bloody, beaten hulks dragged away from his savagery. But Eldridge saw, too, the pitifully broken young farmer, who had sacrificed himself. That steadied him. Eldridge ducked away from that first rush and Brady's powerful arms whistled harmlessly over his head. Then as the giant reeled, off balance, Eldridge struck him behind the ear, knocking him down. A great, glad cry wild from the Irish yard men, profane applause and blasphemous encouragement. The look Brady flung Eldridge from the floor stirred loose a little of the old fear. But now most of his worry was that his pounding heart might not last to the end of a struggle he knew was only started. Brady was coming up slowly, measuring his man. Silence fell. And through it struck the cruel smash of a pick handle against flesh and bone. And Sean McGarvey's howl. No you don't, you dog. I'll kill the next man that tries to stab Sample in the back. Eldridge's eyes flicked to the interruption. And Brady leapt, and struck. Eldridge saw the huge fist coming, tried to ward it off. As well try to ward off. A locomotive. He did ride with a blow, however, else it would have taken his head off. As it was, it drove him through the air, smashed him into the ring of Irishmen and dumped him on the floor. With a roar, Sledge Brady came following it, took off and came down with his great boots poised. Eldridge rolled, seeing the giant only in fuzzy outlines edged with dancing red streaks. There was a dull roaring in his ears, partly from inside his stunned head, partly from the throats of the partisans. Over and over, Eldridge rolled, with Sledge hopping along behind him, swinging his heavy boot. One of those kicks landed on Eldridge's hip, sending waves of pain along his side. But it caught Sledge, too. Eldridge reached for the offending boot, tugged and dumped the giant on his back. The boots. The boots. The yelling of the Irishman filled the tent as Eldridge came bouncing up. But Eldridge backed away, instead. He wanted no boots. That wasn't his way of fighting. Sledge rolled and came up, cursing bitterly. Something seemed to snap in Eldridge's mind and, for the first time since he had been wounded in that rainy darkness, he felt like the Eldridge sample who had once hunted for the W. P. He launched himself at the charging bouncer. They crashed together, raining punches, and fell, together. Brady pounced on his lighter adversary, his fingers hooked as he gouged at Eldridge's eyes, fending off blows with his elbows, holding Eldridge down with his weight. Eldridge lashed out with his flexed legs, heaved the giant off him. Then he rolled after the man, driving breath from his lungs with a full arm swing and hurling himself atop him. Instantly Sledge's arms were about him, like mighty constructors, pulling him in too close for action, squeezing, squeezing. With that awful pressure robbing him of breath, Eldridge worked one hand free and up to Brady's eyes. The man's teeth snapped, fastening on Eldridge's thumb. And Sledge might have bitten the member off save that Eldridge, defensively, sank his own teeth savagely into the giant's throat. Brady bawled and Eldridge snatched his thumb free. Then the bouncer had heaved him yards away and both men were coming up. They circled, with the bedlam of a thousand voices dinning their ears. Eldridge looked short, puny and altogether outmatched. But the giant had tasted of his opponent's strength and was wary about closing. Eldridge fainted, and drove his right into Sledge's mouth. Then he ducked a retaliatory swing. His heart was pounding, pounding, and his breath was jerky and fast. Sledge was spewing blood and curses as he roared in, but Eldridge tied him up, whipping in heavy punches that made the bigger man grunt and give ground. 
Eldridge failed to slip one of the man's pawing punches, went down and bounced up at once. But he was hurt, and showed it. He gave backward, sledge after him, raining in blows. Some of them landed and some missed, but through it all, Eldridge had only the haziest notion of what was happening. Had Sledge possessed the simplest knowledge of the science of boxing, he would have ended the fight then and there. But he could not catch his man. Slowly Eldridge's vision cleared. There was a slow pain in his middle that reminded him of his wound, without bringing up pictures of an assassin's gun flash, without reviving the old terror. But the action of his breath did remind him of a doctor's warning. If you insist upon playing with fire, I can't guarantee your heart. The heart was acting up now, and panic hit Eldridge. He had to finish this before the organ quit altogether. Like a maniac, he tore into Brady, ripping short rights and lefts into the roll of fat at the giant's belt. Brady gave ground, showing that this was his vulnerable point of attack. Eldridge fainted his hands down, then sledged in a blow that exploded like giant powder on the man's jaw. Brady went down, his head bouncing on the rough pine floor. Eldridge stood over him, wiping sweat and blood from his brows. Pandemonium reigned all about. For the first time in the history of these rag cities, Sledge Brady was getting licked. And by a man a half head shorter and fifty pounds lighter than himself. Patty McGinnis was screaming. Give him the boot. Kill him. But Eldridge fought his own fight. He waited till Sledge came writhing up, then smashed him down again. Up and down. Up and down. Eldridge could stand up to the giant now, in the knowledge that he had the most power, despite his dogging weariness. Air wheezed from their lungs as they traded blows. Why didn't Sledge stay down, Eldridge asked himself wearily. And from somewhere a voice kept telling him to fight, fight. The salty taste of blood and sweat was in his mouth. He could hear his own sobs, curses, challenges, without having the sense of speaking them. Brady got up more slowly now, and Eldridge was worrying the Irishman by giving him time. The bouncer was blind, floundering, and Eldridge was little better. He heard the man go down and saw the image of the bloody, beaten Hulk fade from his vision. Then strong hands were seizing him. A mighty, triumphant roar beat in his ears and he was choking on the pungent fire of whiskey. It restored his vision, eased the agony in his pounded body. He stood at the bar, lined now with the hilarious Irishman. Big Sean had an arm around him and was beating the bar for service. Paddy was soaking a rag in whiskey, dabbing at Eldridge's cuts. What a fighter ye are! He enthused. You nearly killed the big varmint. You beat the heart right out of his carcass and, if I know his stripe, He'll never lift his bloody dukes again. Where's that whiskey, Brady, or shall we take your place apart to get it? The boss of Rag City nodded from his place at the bar end. Bottles and glasses were set out and the Irish drank to victory. Cool and unmoved, Buck Brady walked behind the bar, pausing to face Eldridge. You're a better man than I thought, Sample. What now? Eldridge gulped his drink. That's just a one-man sample, Brady, he warned. Get in the way of the road again and you'll think a train hit you. The W. P. is going through, my friend, and you're not big enough to stand against it. Don't try unless you won't fight. The boys want a drink. It's on you. Brady smiled. Sure, he conceded. He snapped an order to the bartenders and walked away. The Irishman knocked the corks out of the bottles and waved them high. Eldridge turned, focusing his eyes on that lone man still playing solitaire as if nothing had happened. To Patty, Eldridge said. Take a bottle to my friend, Ridley. He pointed, and Patty walked over to Ridley's table. The gambler took the bottle with a surprised look around. His eyes met Eldridge's across the interval. He waved his hand, flashed a weary smile, lifted the bottle in a silent toast and let the raw liquor run down his throat. Eldridge acknowledged by drinking, then glanced at Brady. The boss of the respite palace had witnessed it all. He was glowering, champing on the unlighted cigar in his teeth. The restless Irishmen were ready for more excitement than the saloon could provide. Someone ordered the retreat. Bottles in one hand, pick handles in the other, they roared from the respite palace. And Eldridge went with them, his body one vast ache, his legs wobbly as the two Irish straw bosses supported him. Get me down to the office, he mumbled, when they were out in the night air. A bed will look better to me than anything else, right now. Faith and it's the best place for ye, rumbled Sean. They were crossing the street now and, as had happened to Eldridge before, there was a figure in the shadow of a tent wall before them. Well, Sample. A rasping voice challenged. The three of them plowed to a halt, staring. Eldridge, blinking the red fog from his eyes, made out the tall, thin form, the sharp face of Santee Plummer, Brady's ace killer. He saw the glitter of the leveled gun and felt the cold breath of death against his cheek. 
Save for the pick handles they carried, Sean and Patty were unarmed. Patty still carried Eldridge's coat and his gun belt across his arm, almost out of Eldridge's reach. In sudden rage, Eldridge cried. Shoot, plumber, you damned bushwhacker. And he made a frantic grab for the jutting butt of his pistol. He heard Plummer's ugly chuckle as his fingers wrapped the butt of the piece. He snatched it from its leather and was swinging it when the air shuddered with gun concussion. But the bullet didn't plow its way through him as it had done once before. Patty had released him, dropped the coat and belt and was charging the assassin with his pick handle poised. Sean still held Eldridge, cursing savage Irish oaths. Then both the Irishmen were silent as a gun continued to speak, the echoes smashing along the tent fronts and running out into the prairie. Plummer's weapon dropped. He took two stumbling steps forward and pitched full length across the walk. And then, before the wandering eyes of the three witnesses, a man came out of the shadows and strode up to them. It was the gambler, Jasper Ridley. Chapter 10 Ridley came to a halt before Eldridge, his face working, a look of bitterness in his eyes. He waited for Eldridge to speak. Thanks, Captain, Eldridge said weakly. I'm twice in your debt. The gambler finished reloading his pistol, holstered it. Then his head snapped up. Damn you to hell sample. I don't know why I go out of my way to mess with you, or why I didn't let the flood have you. If Brady learns the truth about this, I'm finished at the palace. And Mary, his face darkened. If that devil harms her, I'll. Seething with a rage he seemed unable to express, he turned on his heel like a soldier, and lost himself in the crowd radiating to the scene of the shooting. There's a non one, murmured Sean. What did he mean, Mary? Eldridge didn't answer. For the first time he had plumbed the love of that strange, chill man for the lovely singer of the respite palace. So Brady's eyes had fallen upon the girl and Eldridge could think no further. He felt himself sinking and thought of the doctor's warning again. Everything went black as he clutched at Sean. When Eldridge awoke next morning, it was to find his sleeping quarters choked with men. Sean McGarvey was there. General Prescott stood at the foot of the bed, a uniformed orderly and bodyguard behind him. Joe Hunt and two of his troubleshooters stood just inside the door. The doctor hovered over Eldridge. Eldridge stared, rallied and came stiffly to his elbow. He tried to grin away the agony in his battered body. Lie quiet there, man, snapped the medico. You came close to killing yourself as it was, I don't know why you're still alive. Take it easy. Eldridge lay back on the pillow, a tight little laugh on his lips. Don't worry about me, doc. A good stiff scrap was the medicine I needed. That fright is gone forever. When I get up out of this, I'll give Brady all the fight he wants, and more. You may not realize it, Sample, General Prescott spoke of. But last night's fracas did more to put us over the hump than all our financiers and engineers lumped together. What I can't understand is why you didn't finish the job. Why didn't you pull the palace down around Brady's ears? Eldred shook his head. Look at it this way, General. The palace is not at fault in a strict sense. It's one of a dozen sinkholes of hell that has balked us and slowed us all along the line, the general pointed out bitterly. True. But these hardy, hard-working men you have working for you need such a place. It's relaxation. If we tear it down, Brady will only build another and slow you up even more with damaged suits. What's more, as long as the palace runs, we know where to put our hands on the ones at fault, like I did last night. Hunt and the general swapped glances, nodding at the wisdom of the words. Prescott beamed upon Eldridge. That's a view I've never taken of it, Sample. And it gives me even more confidence in you. You've given the wagon men courage and confidence that we will not let them down. The word has gone out and a steady line of wagons are unloading at our platforms. Now you lie in and mend. If you need anything, just let us know. And thanks again. For two days, Eldridge remained in his bed, thankful for the rest. Patty and Sean visited him every few hours, catering to his wants with as much pride as if he were their champion. Things, they reported, were going well. Flour and other staples were rolling in on the cars, unimpeded. Brady was still buying from some of the wagon men, but the majority came direct to the railroad warehouses. Up ahead, the track layers were matching the records of the Midland Pacific as the two roads rapidly approached one another. Staging a mad race for the valuable land grants paralleling the tracks. Eldridge was about ready to get up, the morning of the third day, when Patty came bounding into the room, his face red with rage. Hell's brewing, he exploded. The wagons have stopped coming. Brady's paying double what they've been getting from us. Now what? Double? Eldridge quit the bed and hurried into his clothes. This was something to worry about. The boss of the Rag City was pitting his easy profits, taken from the workers, against the weakened finances of the struggling road. The worst of it was, 
he had that right. Still far from steady on his feet, Eldridge went out to the wagon camps and talked to the farmers. Money talks, they told him. No, Brady ain't putting no squeeze onto us. He's just upped the price, that's all. You up it again and we'll sell to you. Our folks back home need the money. All along the line it was the same. And Eldridge's hopes fled. The railroad couldn't afford such prices. Back at the telegraph office, he wired brokers in Omaha and Chicago. The answers came back. Prices were not up. But it would take weeks to lay big orders down at Junction City. Within 24 hours please would be rolling in from the front. Food. Food. It was the lifeblood of the road. Racking his brain for an answer, Eldridge was sitting at his desk that afternoon when Buck Brady walked in. The man was smiling, affable. Keep your seat, Sample. I'm here on a peaceable call. We can do some business together. Not with what you've got in your mind, Brady. I thought you said you never made the same mistake twice. I don't, Sample, and that's what fetches me here. I tried bucking you and I failed. I've spent a lot of money. The road isn't buying the stuff in my warehouses and I stand to go broke. I'm quitting. Quitting? Eldridge looked at him suspiciously. He couldn't believe his ears. Now, what? We can deal as friends, Sample. I'll sit in your game, on your terms. What do you mean, Brady? I've overreached myself. I've got agents buying the wagon stuff as far east as Kearney. And no buyers. In two months or less, the two roads will join and the game will be up. What will you offer for my supplies? How much have you got on hand? Smiling, Brady produced a sheaf of papers. Eldridge ran his eyes down the inventory, against which were set prices that were about half what he had been paying. He whistled, raised questioning eyes. Brady nodded. It's yours at those prices, Sample. I might say there are gents here who are trying to form a pool to buy me out. You'll have to move fast and I'll have to have the full amount, in cash. Eldridge looked at the total. That's lots of money, Brady. I'll need time. Half an hour, said Brady, rising. You'll find me at the palace. Hardly able to realize he wasn't dreaming, Eldridge clapped on his hat when the man was gone and went to find Hunt. He found that the superintendent was with General Prescott, at the front. That left the paymaster. That official heard him out with a bored air. To put out that much cash will cripple us, Sample. Especially with financial conditions the way they are in the East. I'm sorry. For a good part of that precious half hour, Eldridge bullied the man. And in the end his pressure got results. All right, Sample. The paymaster finally yielded. I wouldn't do this except that the general told me to cooperate with you in every possible way the responsibility is yours. I hope you know what you're doing. The warrant was drawn and Eldridge hurried over to the palace. Brady was waiting. Good work, he grinned. He marked the invoice and wrote out an order on his warehouse boss. Pull your wagons over and start loading. Eldridge pocketed the papers and went to find Patty. He felt buoyed with the victory and more like himself but he was only allowed the time it took to reach his office to indulge his satisfaction. Paddy came roaring in after him, his hair tousled, his eyes blazing. Faith, didn't you tell me you'd bought Brady out? He exploded. Sure, I did. What's wrong? They loaded a bit of a wagon, roared the excited little Irishman. And told me it was all I'd get. And when I stood up for me rights, they ganged on me. Who did? Fifty of Brady's devils, blast their souls. Armed with rifles, too. Brady's forgotten to send word, Eldridge told him confidently. Come, fetch men and wagons. We'll get our stuff. Patty, darted outside, barking orders, while Eldridge went over to see the paymaster, hoping to dispel a lurking suspicion. Yes, Brady had cashed the warrant and had his money. Eldridge didn't tarry to explain his inquiry. Instead, he hurried over to Brady's main warehouse where he found the smirking Rag City boss and a crowd of his men. What's up, Sample? Brady asked. Eldridge tore his eyes from the armed, loitering men, saw the scorn in Brady's eyes. Why can't McGinnis get the stuff I bought? He asked quietly. He's got it, Sample, all the deal calls for. One wagon load. Eldridge gasped. That's a lie, Brady. I bought it all, and you know it. Better read the invoice, young fellow, and the order on my warehouse boss. Eldridge snatched out the papers, and knew at a glance he had been tricked. First of all a crooked gambler. Brady had run in a cold deck on him. Chapter 11 Bitter self-recriminations raced through Eldridge's mind. He'd been too careless, too sure of himself. He noted at a glance the heavy bars across the doors, the rapidly increasing force of armed men about the place. This was Brady's boldest stroke, and he was inviting Western Pacific to meet it. Long Hank Varco stood behind the boss, 
his hand on his gun, his eyes hot. And Eldridge knew that the slightest resistance would be his own finish. As depressed as he had ever been, as fully conscious of his own shortcomings and certain defeat, he turned to the scowling Paddy. Take the wagons back, McGinnis, he ordered morosely. That'll be all here. We're licked. Like a man in a daze, Eldridge went to one of the smaller saloons, bought a bottle. And, while he drank, he studied the papers Brady had switched on him, wondering how he could ever have been such a fool, so easily hoodwinked. The fading of the writing apprised him that the day was done, that night was at hand. The bartender, preparing to light the lamps, was staring at him strangely. Eldridge rose, went unsteadily out the door and bumped into Jasper Ridley. One look at the man told Eldridge that here was a kindred spirit, equally as unhappy, equally as desperate as himself. What is it, Captain? he asked. Ridley stared at him, vacantly at first. Then his face was convulsed with a killing rage and he attempted to pass. Eldridge grabbed him. The gambler struck down Eldridge's hand. Keep your hands off me, Sample. I'm in a hurry. I've a long, delayed job to do. Job? I'm killing Buck Brady. Eldridge laughed tartly. Surrounded by all his killers? You wouldn't have a ghost of a chance. I'll make the chance, growled Ridley. And pay for it, gladly. He learned it was me who finished Plumber, but it wasn't his way to come at me personally. Nor to send Varco, who knows he's not fast enough. He had to strike at me through Mary. Mary? Eldridge's concern was plain from the tone of his voice. He took her out of the palace and put her in Frisco Molly's place. The gambler spoke from between rigid lips. It's an old game, Sample. He'll keep her locked up there, starving her until she'll be glad to sell her soul for a crust of bread. No. Eldridge snarled it. Then what are we waiting for, Ridley? Let's tear the joint down and take her out. Take her out. Echoed the miserable man. Dead. I'm no fool. You're a fool. Eldridge said scornfully. If you hadn't been, you'd have married Mary and taken her out of all this. Marry her. Ridley bit off an ugly little laugh. I married Mary right after the war, brought her home to my father's house, in Tennessee. She was a Yankee girl and my people were bitter. To think their son would marry an actress and a hated Yankee, poisoned them. They made it unbearable for her. She left the home, not because of their treatment, but in order not to alienate me from my family. And then, Sample, I did the only decent thing of my life. I turned my back on the business of being a southern gentleman and struck out to look for her. I found her at last. His eyes were drenched with misery. She was singing for Buck Brady. I couldn't convince her that she wouldn't be ruining my life by coming back to me. I tried to shame her by gambling for Brady, but it made no difference. Eldridge stared at Ridley, his own troubles momentarily forgotten in the face of this tragedy. How can I help you, Captain? He asked softly. By minding your own business, Sample, was Ridley's snarled answer. I don't know what ails me when I'm with you. I go soft, rotten soft. To hell with you. I've got a job to do. He brushed past as some flaming impulse moved Eldridge. He whirled, caught the gambler's sleeve with his left hand, spun him and swung a short, chopping blow to his chin. Ridley went down heavily. Eldridge caught him as he sagged, shouldered him and headed toward his office through the gathering gloom. Back at his sleeping quarters, Eldridge put the unconscious gambler to bed, hid the man's guns and went out into the office. Joe Hunt and General Prescott were there, having just rolled in from the front on a work train. Both were jubilant. They wrung his hand and praised him for the deal he had made with Brady. With an abiding sense of shame, Eldridge told them how the thing had worked out. And when he had finished, the two officials sank into chairs, wordless. Hunt's shoulders slumped and the general stared at the floor. Eldridge didn't wait for their judgments. Don't be too put out, he told them. I made the deal and the stuff belongs to the road. I aim to get it. Prescott came to his feet, protesting. No, Sample. I think I know what you're planning. But we can't take that chance now. Brady has the law all on his side now, and... To hell with the law, rasped Eldridge. It's back in Omaha, Chicago or Kansas City. Right now, Brady and his crooks are the law on these prairies, a bad law that must be smashed. Any suits he might bring cannot be heard in the two months until the rails meet and the country is spanned. After that, it may not matter. He hitched up his gun and walked out into the night, leaving the two men staring dumbly at one another. Eldridge found Paddy McGinnis in the mess tent and Sean McGarvey taking over the night shift. He got them together and, for some minutes they talked the thing over. Their decision made, Paddy let out a yell and raced toward a puffing work train. I'll be back in two hours, with good old Ireland burning for war. Wait for me. Glory be, grinned Sean, 
watching the train pull out toward the west and the construction camps. It's a bloody fight we'd be after having this night. And Sean McGarvey will have every man in Junction City with red blood in his veins. I'm on the way. He dashed off into the darkness, rallying his crews. Eldridge went back to the office, sent a man uptown to learn how things lined up. The report was somewhat alarming. Brady's got a thousand men lined up, scum of the camps, scourings of the dives, crooks and pimps. Guns for most and clubs for the rest. Looks like a tough nut to crack. True to his word, Paddy came back with five flat cars loaded with roaring, cheering Irishmen, 300 strong. Armed by the railroad against Indian attacks, they had their guns with them. Before the cars rolled to a stop, they were leaping off, following Paddy toward the office, where Sean had a hundred club swinging warriors waiting. Eldridge gave them a short talk. This is a showdown with Brady, boys, and it'll be no picnic. We're taking the law into our own hands and emptying those warehouses. When we get into it, it's every man for himself. There'll be bloodshed, but I don't want killing where something else will serve. This is dangerous and I'll hold it against no man if he wants to back out. Go on with you, shouted a burly track layer. Do you think I'd ride 30 mile behind a crazy engineer just to quit? Lead out, bucko. A roar answered him and then Joe Hunt was running along the platform, holding up both hands. Stop. Stop it, Sample. Brady's got over a thousand men armed and waiting for you. You're hopelessly outnumbered, three or four to one. A bellow of protest rose from the assembled men. Four devils for each of us? Faith and it's Brady's men that are outnumbered? The din they raised was terrific. Eldridge met the superintendent's eyes and in the glance was mutual acceptance of the fact that there was no holding them now. Eldridge jumped down and took the lead. Patty swung along beside him. Eldridge looked around. Where's Sean? He hollered in Patty's ear. Blessed if I know, shouted the little Irishman. Last I seen of him, he was plotting with that gambling man, Ridley. But don't ye worry, he'll be in it somewhere. They were marching now, keeping step, chanting. Their boots shook the ground. Faster, faster. Their heads were lowered between heavy, work toughened shoulders. Their thick arms were akimbo, their weapons at ready. Eldridge was fairly picked up, swirled along in the van. It was as if they were acknowledging themselves as his men, him their leader. They would follow him all the way, he knew that. Even to death. Chapter 12 Eldred's sample was trembling as they swept out of the yards and into the tent-lined main drag. But it was not the trembling he had once known. There was no fear in him, no weighing of consequences. In that moment, he knew he was healed of the wounds Santi Plummer had dealt his spirit that rainy night. Now there was only eagerness, an uncontrollable desire to close with Brady, to wipe him out of the way of the most splendid project the country had ever known him and all his hellish spawn. A yell greeted their appearance and the north side of the street was suddenly thronged with Brady's warriors, blocking the way to the disputed warehouses. Yonder, before the respite palace, they blocked the street. By using strategy, Eldridge might have deployed the railroad fighters, making a show at battle, and so reached his objective. But that never occurred to him. Here was something to be met and put down for all time. Win or die. He called it back to them, and they made those words the theme of their chant. Win or die. Win or die. Win or die. Then they were running, filling the street as they surged toward the braced enemy. In response, an authoritative bellow burst from the center of the Brady phalanx. Back, you scum. Back, or we'll cut you down. As well try to warn back the peak rush of a flooded prairie stream. This was a torrent of flesh and blood and hate. A ragged burst of gunfire broke from the front rank of the renegade force. Numbers of the Irish fighters went down but their fellows stepped over them and plunged on, their own guns spewing death into Brady men. Now the two factions came together and there was a crash of hard bodies locking in mortal combat. No room for aiming and firing now, nor time. Club guns swinging. Pick handles rising and falling. Roars, screams, curses as men went down in the welter of battle. Odds meant little now, as warriors struggled to get through the crush and at some unengaged adversary. Eldridge Sample ducked under a swung gun drove his shoulder point into a man's middle, dumping him. He drove his boots into his victim's face as he surged over him. After that it was like a hazy dream to Eldridge, a nightmare of bruising blows. Once he went down as someone clipped him on the head from behind. A giant form loomed above him, a down swinging gun stock menaced him for an instant. Eldridge's pistol spoke and the man was down. Then Eldridge was on his feet again, shaking his head to clear it, fighting onward, inch by inch, swinging the barrel of his pistol as a bludgeon fighting to live, and for something that seemed more important than life. 
Brady's toughs were neither physically nor spiritually equipped to stand against the Irish. They gave backward. It became a tide. Eldridge's crew cleared the street, followed their foes into the buildings, wrecking them. One by one, the lights of the town were extinguished by the fighting men. Isolated battles raged, clear to the outskirts of the town. But the main body of Eldridge's men followed him toward the warehouses. It was a battle all the way, for a secondary line of toughs, led by Varco, massed before the tent that housed the precious supplies. Here there was more gunplay. Men were falling on each side. A bullet struck Eldridge along the ribs, spinning him about and knocking him down. But he was up at once, hardly conscious of the pain. He had lost all track of Patty, but there was a horde of howling, raging demons about him, driving the Brady men back, step by step. Eldridge led the savage rush that brought his men to the loading platform of the big warehouse. Then came the sterner job of clearing Brady's picked fighters, led by Varco, away from the door. As he fought, bathed with sweat, arm-weary and fatigued, Eldridge kept a lookout for Brady, though he hardly expected that the man would take an active part in the struggle. And the darkness prevented recognition of any kind, until a man was right before his eyes. Clubs and guns swinging, the Western Pacific Irish drove toward the door. Then suddenly the front of the board sided, tent-roofed warehouse burst into flame. And Eldridge saw Buck Brady recoiling, still holding the pail that had held the coal oil. It renewed Eldridge's earlier rage that this man, acknowledging defeat, would burn the badly needed supplies. You dirty dog in the manger! He howled over the turmoil, and leveled his gun. A tough came hurtling into him, preventing the shot. Eldridge killed him. Then the renegades were on the run, racing to get out of the growing light of the doomed warehouse. And the Irishmen leapt after them, intent now only upon their lust to destroy. But Eldridge, with eyes for no one save Brady, climbed frantically to the platform as he saw the boss of Junction City drive his boat through a window, kick out the jagged fragments of the pane and step into the building, the front of which was now wrapped in flame. Gun in hand, Eldridge bounded across the platform and, with reckless disregard for danger, plunged inside. Smoke blinded him in the gloomy interior and he paused, cursing himself for a fool. Brady had probably darted through the place, toward some opening in the rear. The blaze reached the canvas top, filling the room with a weird, smoke-trenched light. And Eldridge stood transfixed. The place was empty, save for a few scattered boxes and barrels. Eldridge was trying to reason out the mystery when his name was spoken, from a smoky corner. Sample. Eldridge whirled, his gun level. Like an ome of darkness, Buck Brady stood there, tensed and ready. And, for a moment, Eldridge knew a grudging admiration for the man who could have killed him from behind but who scorned the methods of his hirelings. Then as the slow grin broadened on Brady's face, as his gun hand jutted, Eldridge knew it was only the supreme confidence of this dictator, his ego. You've underestimated me from the first, Brady, Eldridge cried, and leapt toward that fearsome figure, weaving and dodging. Brady fired, missed, fired again. Something light touched Eldridge's left arm, stingingly. And not until then did the son of Wild Mac drop the hammer of his piece. Eldridge was plowing to a stop then staring. Brady's massive head seemed to settle deeper into his thick shoulders. There was a sudden, stricken look in his eyes as the pistol fell from his grip. You have the luck of the Irish, Sample, he cried in a husky, strained voice. But luck has a way of changing. He didn't finish. His chin tipped down and he fell, full length. And Eldridge wasted precious moments marveling at the mystery of life and death. So strong, so dominant, so dangerous only a moment ago. Now Buck Brady was only a huddle of lifeless clay. His eyes streaming, his lungs racked by the smoke, Eldridge suddenly was shrinking from the blistering heat. It drove him back through the litter, running. At the rear, he kicked out a window and plunged outside. The blast of cool, fresh air was sweet, and he paused a moment to dash the water from his smoke-seared eyes and to fill his aching lungs. With his vision restored, he was suddenly aware of bobbing torches and of something else that made him think he was dreaming. Here, at the rear of the big warehouse, flanked on the other side by a dozen smaller storage tents, was a railroad, where there had been no tracks before. And here was a string of cars, piled high with supplies. Bodies, some writhing, others still, lay upon the ground. A protective ring of bloody warriors stretched around the train, and squads of men, like ants, came and went from the warehouses, loading the provender. Wonderingly, Eldridge moved toward the miracle, expecting to see it dissolve in thin air. Instead, two figures detached themselves from the line about the train, came toward him. Jasper Ridley and Sean McGarvey. Eldred Sample. 
There was real concern now in the gambler's voice and the old dogging bitterness had given way to the lifting spirit of battle. Are you all right, boy? We were worried when. I'm sound enough, answered Eldridge. Thanks to Brady's poor shooting. No. He's dead? Where? In there, Eldridge's hand swung toward the pillar of flame that had been the big warehouse. And even as they looked, Patty McGinnis came hurtling through the open window, his clothes smoking, his coat held over his head. Light as a cat, he lit, cuffed out the burning spots on his clothes, grinned as he spotted them and hurried over. I spotted you through the window, he roared. And it was the nicest bit of shooting I ever saw, when you killed the big varmint. But you must learn to finish your job, bucko. Here. He handed Eldridge the papers, containing the true list of supplies Eldridge had purchased from the boss of Rag City. Patty had risked his life to get them. Eldridge's throat thickened with emotion as he patted the little Irishman on the back. He turned to Sean. But this. He waved toward the waiting train. How in the devil's name? Sure, chuckled Big Sean. I may not have had the same grand fighting as you and Patty, but, be jabbers, me and Captain Ridley, as fine an engineer as I ever seen, beat all the records of the other team laying this spur track. The walls of the burning warehouse caved in, showering the train with sparks. The engine whistled and the Irishman scattered. Eldridge took the slender hand of Captain Ridley. There were fresh, raw blisters on it. Thanks, friend, he murmured. The shoes on the other foot, Eldridge. I, I've got Mary, and the shadow of the man is gone at last. I. He could go on. Eldridge grinned at him and they linked arms, heading toward a street strangely silent now that peace had returned. The word had been flashed east and west across a continent. The rails had joined at Promontory Point. The Midland Pacific and the Western Pacific were being wedded with a celebration and by the driving of a gold and silver spike. For hours, some of the nation's finest orders had extolled the heroes of the great undertaking. And, while his own name led all the rest in honorable mention, General Prescott said nothing. But, from time to time, his glance strayed to the outskirts of the colorful assemblage, out there on the flats, at the abutment of the long promontory jutting southward into Utah's Great Salt Lake, where Eldridge Sample stood with Jasper Ridley the latter's lovely wife, Sean McGarvey and Patty McGinnis. A shadow of a frown touched the brows of General Prescott as he glanced at those four men. He and Joe Hunt alone knew how fully they deserved to be given the credit for what had been accomplished, and how impossible that was. But there was compensation. In their beaming faces, he read pride, contentment, far more priceless than adulation. Each had played his honest part. They had fought the good fight and the spirit that had seen them through to victory, would speed them on to a peace spiced with the deathless memories of a great adventure. The End